and I'm up, see what that's about. We can go around in circles, try to find us out. But if you're looking for the truth, you have to find it out. Yes, I can't go to space, so we hit the roof. Get it, hit the roof. Bet it all came to light with 200 proof. Now I'm just really sick of people lying to me. So when I tell the truth, don't comply to me. Pick up the phone, get on the line with me. Line with me. Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? And welcome everybody to Globusters, the great flat earth gravity debate. I am your host, Bob, or I should say Baller Bob for today anyway, <laughs> Xanadude60, and we are back with another great show for you today. Uh, hopefully we're going to try and dispel some myths that have been going around the community. Um, they were going to do this in uh, a friendly uh, type of fashion. It's not going to be a debate. Um, rather, it's going to be a show that is more about... Uh, I should say the uh, debates that have been going on. Um, so um, anyway, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get to our panel. And I think we, you're full of it, Bob. I think yeah, you're full of it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I know. I, I am full of it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. And you think so too. Yeah. No, yeah. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was my only contentious point. I wanted to get that out. All right, good. Got it. Okay, cool. So we'll go ahead and since he, since Jaren already introduced himself, we'll let him say hi anyway. Uh, first up, Jaren from Journalism. How are you doing, man? Hello, hello. Doing good. Thank you guys for joining us. Appreciate it so much. Uh, hello to everyone in the chat. And hello to Bob. And hello to over there to Iru, upside down in Argentina. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Saludos a todos. Sé que hay mucha gente de habla hispana que sigue este show. I know there is a lot of people of the Spanish uh, community that follow this show. So hello, everyone there. And continue. All right. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we're glad you finally made it in there. We I was getting worried about you a little bit. But uh, no, I, I, I was I, I was stuck in the hole in the fabric of time and space. This time was huge. And I, you know, it, it, it was hard to, to escape that, but I did it. Because you're so massive. And you're, you're I am bending... so massive here. Yes. Yeah, man. You're bending that space time and, and, and causing that uh, downward motion. I feel yeah. bad for you. Yeah, you, 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 you know that. You know perfectly because you do the same thing, right? Right. It's equal and opposite. Exactly. So I'm, I'm here. <laughs> All righty then. Well, there you have it. Okay. Erase this part of the show, please. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, you know what? We tried that, but every time we try and erase a little part of the show, it, it kills the live chat. So, ah, okay. Yeah, that's uh, we kind of learned out the hard way. Oh, this is awesome. I was actually trying to draw this picture that you have on the screen during the time I was doing the uh, the show for FE Core, and this is great that somebody actually already did it. So, perfect. Yeah, well, this is, yeah, they, they did this basically as a uh, illustration to show uh, what the FE Core Force the Level uh, experiment uh, was about, which, of course, we did last weekend, and you know that because you were hosting Globusters. But uh, we do have some preliminary results, and FE Core did do a stream uh, a little bit earlier, uh, disclosing, uh, partially disclosing those results. Now, a lot of them uh, we have to do still a lot of data uh, reconciliation with it because, um, you know, the only thing we're showing here, well, actually, this isn't it. Uh, let's get to a little bit closer place. Okay, this is a little bit closer of the raw data. Um, but ultimately, the results of this test were, overall, it's flat. Gee, what a surprise. So we didn't get any concavity this time, but uh, we did have a couple of uh, strange spikes here. Um, but we think that we're probably going to uh, be able to explain these when we put the weather and the wind data, because we did have a few times when the wind was absolutely ridiculous. It went well over nine miles an hour. And of course, nine miles an hour is pretty much our threshold. And it would cause things to blow over and it would cause the poles to vibrate a little bit. Um, this didn't happen all the time, but um, 
uh, it, it did happen enough to be a little bit of a concern. So we're thinking that that's kind of what these spikes are. Um, but uh, as soon as we get all the weather data uh, correlated with it, um, and then we just kind of, uh, you know, fine tune this uh, presentation, uh, we will be presenting it. So, but uh, overall, it was it was an interesting experience. Uh, tedious as hell. Um, <laughs> uh, very, very, uh, you know, very boring. But, uh, you know, what we were doing, the reason that, you know, we were doing it was obviously because uh, we want to know uh, for sure. And so FE Core devised this experiment uh, using a, a Trimble differential level and Chris Van Maitre. And we also had another uh, surveyor out there that were kind of uh, spearheading it. And uh, um, yeah, the results that uh, were returned ultimately with this, you know, save these couple of spikes uh, came back pretty darn flat. All right. So don't know where John is. So, all right. So next up, um, well, first of all, you, you may have noticed that, that I threw in that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, clip at the beginning and I couldn't help but, you know, be a little bit smart ass about it because, you know, ultimately, I guess in a way, um, what he's saying is sort of correct. Um, and, but we'll be talking about that. I'm certainly not trying to promote Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I, I kind of thought it was a comical clip to throw in at the beginning. So there you have it. All right. So, uh, anyway, uh, if you guys want more information on the force, the level, uh, project, it is under fecore.org project, uh, forward slash forward slash project forward slash force the level. And, uh, you can read all about uh, the theory behind it. I do know that, uh, we had a paid stream for the, uh, advanced members where Chris did an actual whiteboard presentation on it. And maybe I can talk Mike into letting me do that or he'll release it on the, uh, FE core channel, but I would like to show it and kind of go over it uh, and explain it to people because, um, it is a little confusing as exactly how it worked. And it took me a few times to actually, um, you know, say, Oh, okay. Now I get it because I, you know, my big hang up was is, well, if we don't have anything level to reference it with like a stream, then how is this going to work? And, uh, actually it works quite well, but, uh, you have to really kind of understand the entire premise behind it. So we will be covering that at a future date. Um, and of course, it will be coming out at some point on the FE Core channel. So if you guys are not subscribed to FE Core, uh, just go on over to the FE Core Inc. channel and hit the subscribe button. And also go to uh, fecore.org and uh, you can look at our projects and all the things that we are doing there. All right. Cool. Well, you guys are just really talkative today. <laughs> Yeah, completely, man. Completely. I was, uh, yes, and um, last night I, I have a hangout until uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. So I woke up a little bit uh, late today. So that is why I'm a little quiet. And this kind of uh, topic, like gravity, you know, uh, is putting me a little, a little aggressive. So I don't want to talk anymore. I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm anxious. To, I'm anxious to hear the the presentation, and uh, I wanted to ask though, Bob, did you watch the uh, George Mooser interview on Fight the Flat Earth? I did. I did. I thought it was pretty comical. I liked it. I like the statement that, uh, well, it's not exactly a force, but we can what treat it as a force or something like can, that. Yeah, we can think of it as a force. Think yeah, of it as yes. a force. Yeah, classical, I love you. I love you. classical double speak. You got to love it. But uh, no, I know... and, and, and and sorry, well, and I totally agree. There is some video editing uh, at that time you mentioned uh, in that video, Sharon. Yeah, yeah. Same. What happened? There... You pointed out there was like a, a video editing from the host of the of the interview. Yeah, I'm not sure what that was about. Uh, oh, but it's it a little done. fake transition. Yeah, I, you I can use tell. All the time, so. Yeah, you can tell it's definitely cut. Something was cut out of there, so I'm not sure what his exact words were after gravity is not a force, but whatever it was was cut out of there. And I heard that somebody brought that up to him, and he said it wasn't a cut. It clearly was. You can tell. I mean, he runs that as if it's a live stream. You, you know, he's doing the interview with the two boxes, and then he's got, like, people's names on top scrolling across. So it comes across as if it's a live stream, but it's not. It wasn't streamed. It was put together like any other video that somebody makes and then presented as if it's a live interview. It wasn't live. So clearly it's been edited, period. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty obvious uh, that that was happening. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what the deal is with, with the ballers. But, you know, even when, 
even when uh, things come out that would not be what I would consider necessarily favorable uh, on surface, on the surface to flat earth, um, you know, the thing is, is we've got to report it. You know, it's just like when uh, the the um, fiber optic gyro, you know, came out and, and, you know, I didn't exactly like presenting the fact that, you know, we detected a 15 degree per hour rotation. But the fact is that that is exactly what we got. And of course, uh, since then, we figured out why that's happened. And I've explained it on numerous shows. And uh, beyond that, you know, on the first force level experiment, I wasn't exactly thrilled to report that we had uh, detected a slot, slight concavity to the earth. And, um, you know, it is what it is. So we reported it. And just like today, uh, I am not exactly thrilled with taking the position against, you know, a, I wouldn't say the majority of flat earthers, but let's just say that there is a very dedicated uh, group, including, you know, yourself, uh, Jaron, um, that are, are under the impression or that, that have the idea that this downward force, whatever it is, and like I said, I'm, you know, I do not... I, I do not and am not promoting the idea that gravity is bendy space or is it mass attracting mass. Uh, I have said from day one that I believe the density and buoyancy, relative density and buoyancy argument works very, very well, except there still has to be something that gives us that up from down. There's still got to be that bias. And I've done several lectures on it. Um, and yes, I believe that it is related to uh, electrostatic energy. And of course, you can't say that it is absolutely entirely electrostatic energy because there's a magnetic uh, a component of it as well. And, uh, you know, if you want to take what Ken Wheeler says, uh, he calls it a dielectric acceleration. And the dielectric essentially is um, the ether. OK, in my opinion. And, and this is kind of where I'm going to go with this. So. Uh, I just want to present this thing and, and I want you guys to really listen and listen very carefully because um, I'm going to be, you know, doing some thought experiments today and, and uh, also I'm going to provide some hard evidence. And, and honestly, you know, I, I got to tell you guys right now, I've got, I've got two videos that are absolutely, they're nukes, they're nukes. Essentially, they blow the relative density argument so far out of the water um, that it's, it isn't even funny, but I'm not going to use those until the end because I really think that it's important that everybody gets the background and, you know, where, where this has come from and why we have gotten to this point uh, of where we are, you know, in this, this so-called gravity debate. So, yeah, um, you know, so I'm just going to say that whatever gravity is, you know, whether you want to call it an acceleration or a force, if it's a force, well, that's, that speaks for itself. But if it's an acceleration, then every definition in physics tells you that there must be a force to create an acceleration. Okay. So anyway, um, <laughs> that's kind of where I want to go with this. But before I start, what I want to do is I kind of want to take a, a preliminary poll in the chat just to see how many people uh, are on board with one model or the other. So uh, what I want to ask the chat right now is if you believe that buoyancy and density or relative density. Let's just is, call it relative density. Let's relative call density. it relative density. Okay. If you yeah. believe that relative density is all that is required um, for, uh, you know, to explain, you know, everything up and down, all this stuff, type A1. If you believe that there must be a force, an acceleration force of some kind, whatever it is, type A2. So one, if you are a relative density fan, and two, if you are uh, of the idea that there is a downward force, whatever that is, and it is required um, for the relative density argument. So we'll see how that goes. So, Iru, I, you know, I'm kind of curious. I honestly don't know where you are. I suspect I might, but I, I'm not sure. What exactly, if you were to type into the chat, what would you write? Zero. <laughs> Zero. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. Um, no, well, for me, first of all, maybe as the shows go on, maybe, you know, my lack of English for attack this topic uh, will be released. But it, in self, it's a, little, it's, a, it's a very complicated subject uh, to explain and, and trying to prove or present a, a convincing evidence. Uh, do it uh, in other language is a little more difficult to me. But, you know, making the long story short, um, I believe there is 
something that orienting uh, or create the what we call the upside down orientation. But for me, the relat the, the relat relativity density is like uh, the eighty five percent of the explanation of this uh, uh, behave. Uh, we cannot leave out the dynamics that uh, our world produce via temperature, uh, pressure, uh, pre yeah, pressure. It is correct, my pronunciation? Yes. Okay, and uh, electricity and magnetism. But I I understand that the, the point of view of Sheran talking about or, or uh, this relativity, relativity density that maybe will be enough to explain that if you are more dense the the medium that you are in uh, uh, you're gonna react to that uh, for not calling you know going down or be, because you're going to the earth you, you can say i'm going to the earth not down down is just a human concept uh, and i understand the, the the point of view that if the uh, the uh, the earth was up everything will be rotated and oriented itself to that position but I cannot leave apart uh, all these forces or, or dynamics because we cannot test it in uh, in control environment without any other influences. So I I am more in the you know in, in that kind. I don't know if I express myself good, but I am in not in between. But I believe density explaining quite a lot, but. We cannot test it in 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 uh, in that uh, special conditions without any of the other dynamics that uh, our plane produce, be electricity and temperature. Okay, fair enough. All right. Well, I think you may be surprised at what we can test, Iru. And uh, okay, you know, thanks to my my friend that's uh, that is the PhD candidate electrical engineer who sent me some information last night. Um, uh, he actually great, sent me great. this. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I say great. Great. Uh, oh, I yeah. So he sent me a video that, you know, I mean, he told me exactly what he thought and that, you know, that it was uh, impossible not to have a downward force and et cetera, et cetera. And he sent me a great video um, that I, I consider a nuke. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it completely annihilates the relative density argument, um, you know, point blank. But again, that's something I'm going to wait till. A little bit later to drop that bomb, and we're going to kind of go through, uh, you know, some of the other things. So, um, one thing well, I, I think. It, oh, go real ahead. Real quick, I mean, he, he said that he said it's impossible not to have a downward force, and it's impossible not to have a downward direction. So, I mean, you can say that because you have to have a down. You have to have an up, a down, and left and a right. No matter what, no matter where we were located on Earth, no matter where we existed, no matter where humans came from, no matter where they're going, there will always be a down. There will always be an up. up There'll always be a left and a right. It's a human conception, and it's you know based on the on the relative density. So that you know that's my kind of opinion. And again, I think that one of the things that um, scares me about this argument, and actually I'm surprised by the amount of people that uh, typed in one. I really thought that it was going to be an overwhelming amount of two, and I'd actually say that one probably won there. But uh, you know it's probably close. But I think that the reason why people might be choosing one is because they recognize that. Uh, Globers don't care what the downward force actually is. They don't care if it's mass attracting mass. They don't care if it's the bending of space time. They don't care if it's uh, electromagnetic. They don't care if it's magnetic. All they need is they need a downward force holding us all to the ball. And then they can from there say, oh, well, even if we decided today, oh, relative, I mean, um, electromagnetic or magnetism can explain it, can, you know, or prove that there's a downward force. They can take that and run with it and say, yes, there's a downward force and therefore the sun has a downward force and we're orbiting the sun because of its downward force and the moon orbits us because of our downward force. And it's all, again, great action at a distance that, that I don't think exists. So I think that a lot of people are, are recognizing how important this fact is to be a glober. You have to have a, a downward force. You have to have something pulling the earth into the center. You have to have little nuggets of rock that coalesce and start pulling more rock to it and then pull more rock to it and pull more water to it and pull more ocean to it so that you can end up with a sphere. I don't see it that way. I think that uh, Dave Weiss was telling me the other day, he said, you know, they lie about everything, Jaron. They say the earth is a, is a sphere and it's actually flat. They say that the earth spins and it actually doesn't move. He says they say that it's that there's a force, downward force of gravity and it's actually a downward force of electromagnetism. I'm like, hold on, hold on. That's not where you need to go with this. You need to go with 
with where that uh, conclusion should lead you. And where it leads you is if they lie about everything and they say that the Earth spins and it doesn't, and they say the Earth's a sphere and it's flat, then I think when they tell us there's a downward force, we go the direction that there isn't. And until they can prove that there is a force. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to these videos that you got to show, Bob, because uh, I don't think that you can prove that anything pulls anything towards the Earth. Sure, you can prove that electromagnetism can make things levitate, uh, but we know the reason for that. We can explain that. We can show that. We can prove that. But as far as things pulling to the Earth, I think it comes down to relative density. So I'll let you uh, go from there. I just wanted to get my idea out there real quick. And I think a, a good way of describing it that I heard recently is to consider that the, you know, if you kind of think of the density of the air around us as the number one, that anything greater than that number one has to go somewhere. It's in disequilibrium, so it goes down towards the Earth, and anything less than one rises. And, and to me, no matter where we were, no matter, so somebody could say, well, why doesn't things go to the right? Well, if things went to the right, then we'd be standing on the right, and things would go that direction, and we as humans would call it down. And okay. what do you think about and what do you think about the the planets, uh, Jaron, with in respect with relative density? I mean, not not the planets. I mean the 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 things in the sky. Uh, you you believe yeah. that is? Uh, no, I mean, as far as I go, I think that there's two different things. There's the uh, terrestrial things and there's celestial things. And so I'm dealing because I've never been to the celestial objects. Nobody's ever been to the moon. No one's ever been to the sun. No one's ever been to a planet. No one's ever been to a star. So those things to me are celestial objects, and I'm not sure they have to follow the same laws or rules that things terrestrial do. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's a, uh, a nice cycle of things that happen because of relative density on the Earth. A lot of people say, well, Jaron, if relative density was true, then all the gases would line up uh, in order that they're you know, heaviest. So you have you know, no, whatever no, it is. No, no, no. no, no but there's a, we have more T-E-C-T, you know, temp different absolutely. temperatures. Different uh, temperatures. We right. have so dynamics. We have dynamics. So. Correct. And that's what creates the winds. That's what creates all these tornadoes. That's what creates weather is that the sun is heating up different uh, elements of gas. They rise as they get higher. They get cooler. As they get cooler, they become more dense. As they become more dense, they head back down. And that luckily keeps us with a cycle that allows us to breathe the air that we breathe. Otherwise, everything would stack up and we'd have the heaviest gases, which I believe is what ozone, right? sitting at the ground. So that doesn't happen. But anyway, good. Okay. Well, fair enough. Well, one thing I am glad to hear you say, Jaron, is that, uh, uh, you know, down is down and up is up. And that is one of the points of contention that I will be covering today. Um, because even that seems to be, um, uh, in question, uh, by people that clearly believe in relativity and Einstein, but, uh, you know, I'll get to that in a second. And the other comment that I wanted to make is, uh, Globers actually do care um, what is causing gravity. And here's why. Um, because, you know, they not only have to have gravity to explain um, this apparent downward acceleration um, that we have got here on Earth, but they also have to be able to apply it to the planets and the stars and everything like that. Therefore, their gravity in that particular instance is um, it goes back to the idea, well, initially it went back to the idea of mass attracting mass. Now we have the utter nonsense uh, of Einstein's model of that, where uh, you have bendy space and bendy time, and things are actually kind of falling into, um, you know, that those pockets of space, if you will. So if you say that it is magnetic, that doesn't necessarily explain it. If you say that it is electrostatic, that doesn't explain uh, the planets. Because remember, to us, the planets and the stars are just lights in the sky. Um, they're energetic points, yes, but what exactly they do, I don't think anybody really knows. But in the baller world, um, they must have that mass attracting mass or bendy space uh, gravitational pull to be able to explain their orbits or their, uh, you know, orbits of the ISS or orbits of the planet or anything like that. So, um, you right, know, but to they them, do care. Both those, to them, both those things are equal. So that's what I mean. They don't care whether the, the force is mass attracting mass or whether or not it's the bending of space time. And they really wouldn't care if it's an electrostatic force, if it still causes the same acceleration towards the Earth because they can explain everything in their universe with it. So they don't, they don't need it to be mass attracting mass. They just need things to be have a downward acceleration caused by the mass below your feet, whether that's an electrostatic, whether it's a, a pulling of gravity, whether it's the bending of space time. I don't think they care at all because they need that to create the earth to be a sphere. Uh, you know, that's why I said that they'll never get rid of gravity. It'll never be taken out of the equations is no matter how wrong it is. It'll never be removed from their equations. It'll never be removed from little G. Uh, it'll ne they'll never 
give up the fact that they've completely hijacked the idea of weight. They'll never give up any of that because they need it for the Earth to be a sphere. And that's why, even though, and I played Richard Feynman talking about it, saying if something doesn't match observation and testing, then it's wrong. It doesn't matter. When it comes to gravity, it doesn't matter. Uh, they'll just change the rules. So uh, if we couldn't prove that mass attracted mass, which they couldn't, then that's why they had to come along and say, oh, well, it's actually a space-time thing. And uh, they'll always come up with something that makes the Earth a sphere because they can't give that up. It's their very foundation of everything they've ever believed in. Uh, that's why I think this is such a, a big point. And that's why I'm a little shocked that, um, but again, I want to be shown that, that, that there is proof of that because otherwise it shows me kind of a scary thought that flat earthers are still married to these things that we were taught that I think were indoctrinated into us. One of those things is the fact that uh, things fall down and that means that there's a force pulling them down. That, to me, I don't think there's any any proof of any kind of force. I think it's simply relative density. If I lift something up that's more dense than the air, it has to go somewhere. It's in disequilibrium. So whatever direction that went would be called down. So again, you just said earlier, Jaron, I'm, I'm happy you agree that there's an up and a down. Well, yes, there always will be an up and a down for us humans. That's a concept. Um, no matter where we were located, we would call the direction towards our feet down and the direction above us up. So, I mean, as far as it being a preferred direction or anything, I mean, no, it's relative density sorts those things out. And, and you know, it's just like if a if a leaf is at the bottom of a of a pool and it floats to the top, or let's say it's growing on a plant at the bottom of a, of a pool or a, a lake and, and releases, that's going to go up. So, um, you know, it just depends on the, the medium that you're in. Okay, cool. Well, fair enough. Um, that's, uh, you know, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And again, still, I, I disagree and I'm going to produce evidence uh, to the contrary. So, but before... Awesome. Before we get to that, um, I, I, I would like people, we have a moderator in chat. Um, his name is Racer FE. And Racer FE is kind of well known for posting really, really relevant um, either short quotes or comments or uh, concepts or anything like that. So um, you guys might want to pay attention to what Racer FE uh, says in the chat um, because he really. Uh, is on point, uh, you know, virtually all the time, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, point that out uh, to everybody. So, all right, so let's get down to this. Um, so like I said a minute ago, I, I'm really glad that you decided that, you know, that, that there is an up and a down. And even if you don't believe in gravity and believe in the relative density model, there still must be an up and down. Um, but, uh, you know, so... I'm going to, we're going to start covering that. And, you know, I don't like to pick on anybody, but in this particular case, there's one guy um, that is on a popular debate channel that uh, discusses this. And uh, my problem with him is that, you know, it's not okay to just disagree um, with him. He needs to call people agents and ignorant and shills. And in my book, that's not okay. All right. So, um, we're going to start with that. Uh, the first thing we are going to knock down dead is the idea um, that is promoted by another popular debate channel that up and down are relative. Okay, so here we go. So here's this particular uh, video, and it's called Dear Ignorant Flat Earthers. And we are going to hear this out and see why, um, you know, this person thinks that we are ignorant. <laughs> when in fact it's really quite the opposite but uh, let's give this a listen here we go guys is there an absolute up and down it saddens me to see some flat earthers thinking that there is an absolute up and down to reference the earth you are applying a frame of reference you are applying a frame of reference. Quick citation when you do a search for absolute direction takes you to a redirection page that takes you to relative direction on Wikipedia. Pay attention boys and girls, this is not difficult. Even fight the flat earth should get his head around this. It's not something that's considered to be difficult for, you know, grown-ups. The most common relative directions are left, right, forwards, backwards, up and down. Literally the first line tells you that the relative directions are up and down. Next line. No absolute direction corresponds to any of the relative directions. And then 
as we're all into the flat earth discussion, for those of you that still think that somehow this can be dispensed with, here's the science that proves it. As demonstrated by the Michelson-Morley null result, there is no absolute inertial frame of reference. Think about that one. Next time you claim that there is a up and a down that's absolute, that we can all relate to, yeah, it's relative. It's not absolute. Stop misleading people. Just accept that you've got it wrong. We all understand it. Why is such a small portion of Flat Earth not getting their heads around this? It's embarrassing, guys. Black and white, come on. <laughs> All right. All I can say to that is ego much. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, that entire thing is preposterous, and the, you know, the evidence given for it um, is essentially going into Einstein and his relative earth a relative motion, relative everything, relativity, right? This is that, that video is literally promoting relativity. Why do I say that? Okay. Well, let's put on our thinking caps here for a second. And the first thing that, that we read in Wikipedia and guys, remember Wikipedia is on the agenda that this is a ball earth. Okay. Um, and that is their position that it's coming from. So they say the most common and common relative directions are left, right, forwards, backwards, up and down. Uh, no absolute direction corresponds to any of the relative directions. Now, <laughs> I will agree with the statement that left and right are relative because Jaron, if you and I are face are standing up and we're facing each other and I put out my left hand and you put out your left hand, well, guess what? Our hands are pointing in different directions, right? Uh, also, additionally, I will agree that forwards and backwards are relative directions. Because again, if you and I are standing in front of each other and I take one step forward, that's my forward. And, you know, that would require you to take one step back. So my forward is your backwards and your forward is my backwards. So thus we can safely say that forwards and backwards are relative directions. But when it comes to up and down, okay, there is only one place that up and down could possibly be relative, and that is on a ball, right? And thus, I can make the statement that if I'm standing on the North Pole and you're standing on the South Pole on a ball, that our ups are completely opposite from each other, and therefore, up and down are relative. But the problem is, is we're not on a ball guys, we're on a flat earth. Okay. And so on a flat earth, up is up and down is down period. Okay. There is no, there is no relative direction to this. Uh, down is earthward. Up is away from earthward. Okay. And so, and, and, to, and then to elaborate on this, what makes it even worse is he says um, that he then cites this as evidence as demonstrated by the Michelson Morley null result. There is no absolute inertial frame of reference. Again, this is not only a straight up lie, it's complete bollocks. All right. Uh, so if you want to put yourself and you want to pr be promoting a ball earth and a heliocentric universe, then this statement is absolutely okay, but it's not okay on a flat earth because First of all, the Michelson-Morley did not demonstrate um, a, 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 a absolute inertial frame of reference. In fact, what the Michelson-Morley demonstrated was what, that there was no forward motion around the sun. Now, the baller's excuse was is that, uh, well, there's no uh, absolute inertial frame of reference because everything is in motion. But again, as flat earthers, we know full well the earth is not moving. Okay, so um, that in and of itself is a complete nonsense. You know, it makes absolutely no nonsense and no sense whatsoever. So there you have it. Um, so Tony is using Einstein's relativity um, and he's citing uh, absolute falsehoods about the Michelson-Morley null result that is not true whatsoever. 
um, you know, stating that there's no absolute inertial frame of reference when in fact the fixed and non-moving and stationary earth is an absolute inertial frame of reference, period, end of story, unless you're a glober or you believe that Einstein is, is correct. So any comments on that first of all? Well, I'm not a glober, and I don't think that Einstein was correct, but I think that to humans and the directions we decide, the concepts that we agree with, that the, yes, there is an up and a down. So I guess that's, is that what you're getting at? Yes, there's an okay. absolute up and down, and it is not relative unless you're a glober or a relativist. No, or unless you understand that humans come up with concepts and ideas that we all agree on. One in particular is that there is an up and there is a down. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And and even you, you know, you said on several occasions that, yeah, uh, the density, that most dense things are going to be down, downward, earthward, um, you know, and it's, it's going to be the same direction in Australia. Uh, again, because we're not on a ball earth, we are on a flat earth. We are in Correct. a flat, non, non-rotating, stationary, fixed earth that gives us an absolute inertial frame of reference, period. Okay, the, I, I don't even know how anybody could possibly dispute that, uh, unless again you're a baller or a relativist. Okay, so that or unless it, you, I mean, yeah, you keep saying, but unless you decide that you, or you understand that humans have created concepts, that one of them being up and down, and that to us we might consider, we'll always consider where the sky is up and where the ground is down. Correct. Yeah. So it is rel it is relative direction. Mm -mm. All right, you're going to have to clarify that. How do you how do you think it's relative direction? We we all know that or the down is earthward. Period. I mean, there's Correct. there's no other direction yeah. for down. It's an absolute direction. Sure, it's not absolute because we've we've all agreed that it's absolute. As humans, we've agreed that towards the earth is considered down. Yeah, yeah. Well, that okay. that's true. Okay, yeah. I'll go along with that. We totally agree okay. that. But but the, our concept of it. All of us will agree, yes, like you just said, that towards the earth is absolutely down. Um, it is not a subjective thing. It's pretty much objective uh, unless you're standing on your head or something. I mean, I'm sure the ballers or uh, a sleeping warrior can come up with some, um, you know, ridiculous excuse for this. But the bottom line is, is that I think everybody knows that down is earthward and you know, on a flat earth, earthward is down and it's down is down is down no matter what part of the world you're in. So that's the first thing that I want to say. And you have to understand, like I said, Wikipedia, relative direction, of course, they are promoting not only relativity, but they are, are promoting the idea of a ball earth. So to actually cite this um, and, and, and not even understand that Michelson Morley did not demonstrate a null result, that is absolutely a, a straight up lie, um, then, you know, again, what he's doing here is he's referencing a, an Einsteinian concept um, and he's essentially saying that, well, we must be on a ball, uh, which is, you know, doesn't exactly look good for any flat earther that's, that's you know, promoting this idea. Up is up, down is down, we don't move, and the earth is an absolute inertial frame of reference. Okay? And that's all I think I really need to say on that. Uh, Ira, do you have any comments on it? Uh, I don't know my orientation right now, man. I am starting to get confused. Uh, <laughs> but no, no, for me, you know, it's a little strange all this about orientation because. We say down, up, we can call it uh, uh, earth direction, if you want, or, ma or more massive or dense direction, because you know we, ref right. we, we, we take into consideration the earth. So we can change you know, the words. Uh, and it's, for me, it's like, uh, I, re I remember that video about Steve Shops you know, uh, leaving an object falls and say, uh, and, and ask to the, uh, journalists, you know why this fall down? Nobody knows. Nobody in the entire universe knows why this fall down. We can predict, we can measure, we can blah, 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 blah. And all this concept about orientation, uh, for me, is like the same. Uh, I mean, nobody knows. Uh, I, I believe we have some uh, order in this creation. It's, it's, you know, it's like the rules that this place was created. 
uh, it's like uh, asking ourselves what why we have water why there is dirt why there is uh, you know i mean you can explain it but you you cannot create it right you are not allowed to create you know matter we cannot create matter we can uh, you know uh, interchange or we can uh, like an alchemist, you know, uh, mix metals or, or take the the, uh, the oil and make plastic, uh, you know, petroleum. I don't know which is the name in English. All that kind of stuff. But there is, there are there are things that are the way they are because it is the way it is. <laughs> you know, I mean, and this right. kind of uh, th- this kind of um, orientation is like, okay, this is the rules. This is how the world was set up to have an order, to have conditions, blah, 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 blah. And that is why maybe I, I am more in the side of uh, Sheran. And, and I changed my mind in the last week, if you want to, if you ask to me. But still, but still, I believe there is like a really big influence with the mass of the earth. I'm not saying that there is attracting the... Because, like Tesla said, could be a force not pulling, could be a force that pushing, uh, like a, like the atmospheric pressure, uh, you know. But I, I am not. I, I don't have the tools to test 100% uh, the relativity density without contemplating any other dynamics that this world produces. I, I don't. I don't see how you can avoid all the rest of. Uh, so-called forces like the electromagnetism, the pressure, the temperature, the this magnitude, because someone are called forces, other are magnitude. But I don't know how you can test something in when the independent variable is just density. Right, I kind of agree with Iru here that it's a strange conversation, and we could we can call things earthward, we can call things skyward, uh, and no matter where we existed, we would have this same argument. So. Uh, I agree that, there, that in order to have any order in the world, uh, something had to be set, uh, and that to me is you know disequilibrium. That as soon as something is out of disequilibrium, it has to go somewhere. And the fact that we have the most dense thing that there possibly could ever be, which is the Earth, is what constitutes rocks and dirt and uh, everything heavy, water and rivers and lakes and, and you name it, grass and everything that's the most dense creates the bottom layer. And so. That's where we stand as being dense beings that we are. That's where animals stand, being dense beings that they are. And so all of a sudden, we have to create something to call that, and we call it down. Uh, Is there a force that's pulling that stuff down? Well, I think that that's just relative density, that it has to go somewhere. It's in disequilibrium. And no matter if it went to the right, left, up or down, to to the northwest, to the north, it doesn't matter which direction it went. We would stand there, and we would be having the same argument. So it's a very strange conversation. Uh, I agree with Iru. You know, I don't think that yeah. there'll ever be an answer to this. Okay, yeah, totally. Well. Be- be- between flat earthers, you know, maybe. But I, I understand one of the important point here, which is uh, this force, and I also agreed that the, the we have implanted, we have been implanted with that idea because the Globers needed to explain uh, his universe. Right. Uh, yeah. I understand completely that. Okay. Well, cool. Um, no problem. And uh, you know, just just so you know, guys, I'm going to make you eat those words. But anyway, wow, right. <laughs> I'm hungry, man. I'm, I'm really hungry. <laughs> but you know what, uh, guys? Seriously, um, we're doing this in a very friendly way, and this is what I want people to understand: that yes, Jaron and I disagree. Iro and I may disagree on some point. Not sure where John is yet, but you know, we can talk about this in a friendly way. And you know, I honestly know that Jaron and Iru both have enough integrity that if I uh, actually do pull off convincing him that there is a downward force, um, that they will be the first to admit it. Um, and, and the same goes for me. Um, if, if somebody gave me a convincing argument that, that to me was irrefutable, I would certainly change my mind. But, you know, in my mind, the evidence points towards uh, a force actually being there. And like I said, I'm going to demonstrate that the things that you don't think are de- demonstrable, um, they are demonstrable and they have been demonstrated. And um, I, I'm also, so yeah, so we're going to go there. Also, another thing that it says in the traditions and conventions of this relative direction, of course, is one common definition of up and down uses gravity and the planet earth as a frame of reference. I, again, the planet earth as a ball, as a frame of reference, 
And in that frame of reference, you can look at, uh, you know, up being uh, one direction and down uh, and up being also another direction, depending on where you are on the ball. But, you know, like I said, and I'm stressing this, <laughs> we're not on a ball, guys. Therefore, this that kind of dismisses this idea. So, all right. So enough of that. Now, one thing I, I forgot to cover at the beginning of this um, is that, you know, I'm going to kind of outline what today's objectives are going to be. Um, the first thing, uh, first objective will be to show that up and down are not relative directions. And I think, uh, you know, I've just done that. Whether or not it's accepted or not, that's up to you guys. Um, but uh, uh, I think that uh, I've given a pretty decent argument uh, through logical thought. And even Jaron agrees on some level that, uh, you know, there must be an up and a down. So uh, I will call that a check. The next thing, um, uh, next objective will be to cover both the mainstream and the alternative viewpoints on gravity. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to engage the audience in a few thought experiments. The next thing is to show that this effect we call gravity does indeed meet every requirement for the definition of force. Okay, now I'm not saying what that is, but what we're observing and what I'm going to demonstrate, um, uh, absolutely by textbook, and we are going to go to the dictionary definitions, the physics definitions, everything uh, will absolutely meet every requirement for the definition of force. And and you know, on that note, uh, before I go any further, um, I want to say again that you have to keep in mind that there is a heliocentric model and then there's a non-heliocentric model. And, uh, you know, we even did a show on this. Why do we play by their rules? You can't be thinking in that frame of mind, uh, frame of reference, if you will, um, if you're going to uh, understand this because, and, and I'm not supporting the globe at all. Um, I'm, you know, trying to get another point across. All right, cool. So the next thing on the objectives are to show that without the so-called force or acceleration or effect or phenomenon of gravity, whatever it is, the concept of relative density and buoyancy are rendered completely moot. And what that means is, is and what I'm saying is, and what I'm going to demonstrate is, is that if you do not have that downward force or something that is setting that bias, then relative density doesn't work. And I can prove it. Okay. And I'm going to prove it. All right. So next thing on the agenda is, um, well, it says the last thing presented will absolutely drive a stake through the heart of the bogus relatively de relative density only assertion. And again, that's my nuke. I actually have three of them. It's not just one. There's three. Um, so there we have it. Okay, cool. So next up, what we want to do is we want to, oh, we already did the Michael Samorda experiment. And guys, on the Michael Samorda experiment, uh, we have, you know, kind of beat it to death, uh, especially with the fiber optic gyro and the presence of the ether and all of that stuff. Of course, the the mainstream position on the Michael Samorda experiment now is the reason that it returned a null result is because of the um, uh, uh, Lorentz contraction, which, of course, is a mathematical construct. It's utterly nonsense. Um, that is their reason for saying that the Michelson Morley experiment uh, null result proved a a, a, a not and an, a reference frame. Uh, bleh, boy, I'm having a brain cramp. Sorry, guys. I'm not feeling really that great today, so I'm a little addle-brained. So, anyway, we've gone over the Michelson Morley experiment many, many times. So um, we won't go there anymore, uh, other than to say that. Uh, it did not prove what uh, Anthony Riley or Sleeping Warrior, uh, Warrior asserted that it did. Okay, um, so let's go over some of the definitions. Um, and I will use not only Wikipedia, but uh, some other sources as well. But an inertial frame of reference, we want to cover that first, in classical physics and special relativity is a frame of reference in which a body with zero net force acting upon it is not accelerating. That is, such a body is at rest, or is moving at a constant speed in a straight line. In analytical terms, it is a frame of reference that describes time and space homogeneously, isotropically, and in a time-independent manner. Well, first of all, again, they're, they're saying that, that bendy space goes along with bendy time, and that is utterly nonsense. And not only that, frames of reference, um, 
you know, kind of fall apart when they go from a linear type of frame of reference to an angular frame of reference. In fact, um, that's one of the things that, that is a critical baller mistake is they're always trying to put our solar system and everything like that into a frame of reference. Uh, but it is immediately invalidated by the fact that it is not a linear motion that we're talking about, but rather an angular motion. So all of this Einsteinian uh, nonsense is just that. It's nonsense. We don't have bendy space. We don't have bendy time. And I think that's something that we can all agree on. Um, so there you have it. We so, don't have even time, <laughs> not bending time. Yeah, exactly. Time is a concept. Time. Right. Time is absolutely a concept. And so... Uh, if you guys are interested, and this will be in the show notes, but there is a web, web website that absolutely is brilliant at debunking uh, Einstein's nonsense relativity, okay? And it's called Alternative Physics. Um, it's a great, uh, it's kind of like an online ebook, and it makes perfect sense. Um, the guy literally just tears apart the entire uh, relativity argument. So that's something that uh, you may want to take a look at, and it will be in the show notes. All right, so... Next up, I want to lead off with a quote that Jern is very, very fond of quoting, and rightly so, um, because uh, it makes a lot of sense. But what I don't think Jern has done, you know, to be fair, is I don't think he's really looked at the entire quote um, in context to see really what Newton was talking about. Now, granted, uh, Newton thought that this whole idea of uh, Earth's gravity affecting the moon and stuff like this was nonsense. Um, he didn't believe that. But let's go ahead and read this quote, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to talk about why I think that that Jaren may have missed a, a point on this, and we'll discuss it friendly, <laughs> like okay. So Newton says, "It is inconceivable that inanimate brute matter should, without the mediation of something else which is not material." operate upon and affect other matter without mutual contact, as it must be if gravitation in the sense of Epicurus be essential and inherent in it. And this is one reason why I desired you would not ascribe innate gravity to me. That gravity should be innate, inherent, and essential to matter, so that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum, without the mediation of anything else by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man uh, who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Now, guys, I want you to notice that he's talking about, you know, like Earth, Earth's gravity acting on distant objects like other planets or moons or the sun or anything like that. That's actually what he's talking about here. And I'm sure that, that most flat earthers will absolutely agree with that. Okay, so let's continue on. Now he says, gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws. But whether this agent be material or immaterial, I have left open to the consideration of my readers. Well, well what does he mean that, by that? That he, of course he means I'm, that well, he, he left it open for Einstein to come along and say, Bendy be space time. <laughs> well, that's that's one way to look at it. Well, that's what he meant. He meant gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws. He couldn't think of what that could be. He says, So whether this agent be material or immaterial, I've left open to the consideration of my readers because he couldn't come up with it. Well, it took Einstein writing a paper coming up with the idea of Bendy space time to prove that that action can happen and it not be material. And that, that's what they have to go with because they can't prove that it's a material force. So they have to come up with something. If it's not mass attracting mass, which Newton said that would be impossible, he didn't want that described to him. So it took Einstein coming along and saying, oh, well, we can actually have the bending of space time, which allowed them to continue on with the immaterial. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to explain what I think he meant by it. All right. When he says gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws, uh, first of all, obviously, Newton acknowledges this thing called gravity since he's the one that kind of more or less discovered it and, and you know, came out with it. But what he's saying is that there is some sort of a constant, a, an agent acting constantly. In other words, he's saying that there is a constant force, all right? But he doesn't know what that is. He doesn't know if that, that force is material or immaterial. 
And he doesn't want to go there because he doesn't want to take it to the point where it's acting on bodies outside of, of the earth and things that we can tangibly lay our hands on. Okay. So that is my interpretation. Now, of course, this was act, asked in Stack Exchanger Physics, and you get some very, very interesting responses to this. Some are uttered nonsense, and some make a few, a, a little bit of sense. So one thing, uh, one answer, uh, consider the image below, which depicts a gravitational field being produced by a massive object. Other objects in turn respond to the gravitational field that is present in their local vicinity. Um, that is, the moon in the image below isn't responding to the Earth directly uh, through a mysterious action at a distance, but rather the moon is responding to a nearby gravitational field produced by the Earth. Okay, Newton is stating he believes that gravity must work locally through something like a gravitational field depicted below rather than be in true action at a distance. Well, that's that's partially right. It, it is Newton was saying that he he believed that gravity is a local type of phenomenon, um, and this, of course, depiction would be the baller interpretation of it. But really, um, that this is the very thing that Newton was was speaking out against is that um, that you know, Earth's gravity was actually acting on uh, the moon or other foreign bodies. Okay, so. Um, another guy says, just to add, action at a distance was impossible in the philosophy of the day. Uh, and one of the main objections to Newton's gravity was that an object's mass affected a distant object. Well, that's that's essentially what Newton was saying. No, it, it's like, no, our Earth gravity is not uh, affecting distant objects like the moon. And that is why he didn't want his name associated with this concept. Okay, so another guy says... You have to choose either the gravitational field is a mathematical construct used only in calculations, or it is a physical object which, which exists in space between Earth and the moon. If a physical object, then space is not a vacuum. It has some particles or waves in it, so it is not nothingness. If it is just a mathematical description, then we can po postulate a true vacuum that space, but in that case, the force is acting at a distance with nothing to mediate it. Uh, therefore, trying to have it both ways is a contradiction and therefore wrong. Well, I agree. You can't really have it both ways. So all right. I'm saying, Dern, is that I, I'm. I, it, it's my opinion that that Newton was trying to say that, yeah, there is something that appears to be an attractional force, but he doesn't know exactly what it is. And he's going to leave that open to the consideration of his readers. Well, yeah, he didn't want it ascribed to him that mass attracts mass. So if you scroll back down to that one person's comment, that person, the second comment is exactly correct. That uh, we have to we have to understand that it is a mathematical concept. Th that that's what they had to go to because they couldn't prove that it to be physical. And when you can't prove something to be physical, the only other place to go for science and uh, astronomy and everything else is to go to a mathematical formula to pull mathematical concepts and to try and pass them off as real. That's exactly what they've done with gravity now because they couldn't prove it to be a physical force of mass attracting mass. Believe me, if mass attracted mass, they'd be able to prove it. They'd show it in a test quickly. It'd be easy and we'd go on with our lives. They can't prove that. So they had to have Einstein come in and give a mathematical equation, a mathematical conception, an idea of space-time that's being bent. And then with that, added dark energy, added dark matter, and everything else that they've added has been nothing but mathematics to to fix the problem. And as far as uh, why, you know, I think you said something about, um, uh, you know, why do things go down? Maybe you said that earlier. Um, if they were just, it's so simple. It's just relative density. And then think of how everything else goes away. Dark matter, dark energy, the ideas of the space time, all that stuff goes away simply. But right. they can, they'll never do that. So right. they have to, they're going to have to go to mathematical concepts. And that's where we've gotten now is that the mass bends space time in a way that gives us the effects that we can measure as, as gravity. Exactly. Uh, and, and you know what? Uh, another thing, and this is maybe a more uh, historical uh, point of view, but when when we talk about Newton, we must be remembered that Newton comes uh, for fulfill the the problems that co you know the Copernican model. Right. Because everything started in the church. Everything started with the Jesuit. Everything starts with Copernicus, okay, then come, you know, Newton, Galileo, Kepler, and so on, so on. But all, and that is my opinion, all these guys that trying to debunk 
a creator or you know whatever you can put the name you want and they look up in the sky and I say up <laughs> they look into the sky and trying to figure out what's going on there but all these guys never knew about electricity yes so they have been 300 years mm -hmm. trying to say no maybe it's this force no maybe it's the other no maybe it's this maybe it's that and then 300 later uh, the science revolution at the 18th century start to work with electricity and start to control electricity and show that electricity can make objects, you know, levitate and orbit and uh, attracting and repulsion and then comes the magnetism but has been 300 years with a line of thought to trying to, you know, <laughs> explain the universe and a lot of people die and a lot of controversy you know in the in the religion institution and the royal academy of london and blah 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 so when they discover the maybe the real force the real dynamics involved on those celestial objects which for me it's the electricity the magnetism and the medium where these objects are they say what what are going to do is we're going to say the people that we have been wrong 300 years never thinking in a force with that doesn't we, we cannot prove and we know that doesn't exist or we keep this you know uh, nonsense with uh, a patch over another patch trying to uh, and that is my opinion i don't know if uh, you understand what i'm saying but all this calculation all these uh theories all these mathematical propose are based because these guys never knew about electricity. Right, yes. I totally agree with you on that point. He, he's absolutely right. And so if an electric force is the answer to all those questions, then we'll be able to easily see that and see it in testing. And uh, we'll be able to show that if you put something in a Faraday cage, that it weighs less than it does when it's outside the Faraday cage. Very easy to, 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 to cancel out electric forces and to see if the electric force is what's pulling things down to the Earth. Yeah. Okay, good points. Good points, guys. Excellent. All right. Yeah, and we we have also I don't know maybe this is just out of topic and it it, it doesn't have any sense. But anytime that I see like a lightning ball, you know, in, in in a few shows ago we pointed out that uh, anytime we talk about light, we are talking about gas being sight, exciting or have some kind of ignition because without any gas we don't have light, visible light. Right. Correct. So, yes. I mean, when when the thunderstorm with with lightning strike the the the, the earth, uh, is going to the earth, or sometimes it's rising up from the earth. I don't know exactly. Some 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 guy said that the thunderbolt, uh, the the lightning bolts go from the sky to the ground. Sometimes they say no, it's produced on the ground and go up. And uh, but that is like a, a divine orientation <laughs> without any kind of mass. I mean, there is this connection uh, between uh, this plane of inertia or I, I don't know what is the name that we can put, it, but I just want to drop on the table. OK, good points. All right. So, Jaron, you mentioned a little while ago that, you know, Globers don't really care what gravity is, whether it's electrostatic, magnetic uh, mass attracting mass bendy space because you you said that uh, they can just um, take it out into space and everything works fine but obviously that's not true everything doesn't work fine because when you try to apply those gravitational computations uh, i.e. mass uh, and force and all that stuff f equals ma things don't work out in space using those equations and the the evidence for that is obviously they have create had to create dark matter and black holes and and uh, you know extra part you know particles that aren't there um, in other words they're constantly putting band-aids on it all the time now right so that answers i mean that explains what i said they don't care they don't care because whatever it is they'll still be able to explain it, it doesn't matter even if gravity doesn't work in their outer distances and their outer galaxies they still tell the same story. They just add particles. They just so I'm saying they, they don't care what they care about. The reason Globers hate flat earthers, especially myself, is when we say something like relative density, they'll throw a fit because that takes away the idea that anything can ever become a sphere. So because of relative density, things don't become a sphere. 
that, that doesn't make any sense. But there's no reason why things would pull to the center of a mass. But when you're talking about electrostatic forces, when you're talking about gravitational forces, when you're talking about mass attracting mass, then all of a sudden you can explain the world in a way that gets rid of the creator, gets rid of God. Uh, because you can just say, oh, we're all part of these spheres, and these spheres happened because of this great thing called gravity, which pulls things to the center. Even though gravity makes no sense, how could anything get started? If you just have one speck of dust, obviously we've seen in parabolic flights that if you release ping pong balls in there, uh, they don't attract each other. They go everywhere. So the universe would be a scattered mess if it's not for something pulling things to the center. And I'm saying they don't care whether that's electrostatic. If that was able to be proven, they'll adopt that. Why not? Why not say, and except for if, the, if you agree with what Iru said, which is science never wants to go back on itself and admit that they were wrong for hundreds of years. So it's easier for them to just create mathematical gobbledygook and say, okay, well, we'll just pull this equation in, we'll pull this equation in, rather than to ever say our foundations are wrong. Because the second they, they do that, they're going to start losing the hold that they have on everybody, which is all you have to say is the word science, and people immediately think that what you're about to say is, is fact. Exactly. Especially, especially in terms of the universe where there is a place that nobody knows and go. I mean, it's like talking about the, the, the who is in the heaven. Is it Jesus in the heaven, made paperwork and, and waiting to, you know, pass time and then, and then come back? Uh, you know, talking about the, the, the sky is like trying to explain, you know, the religion based on what we see in the heaven. Uh, because, yeah, we, we can see the heaven and we can, you know, talk about a lot of things. We can see this so-called universe, but there is an static universe, never change, never move any, you know, never, uh, we, we have been the, covered this topic a lot of time, but we are not in expansion. We are not, we are not go there. So it's like playing day game. You know, we're trying to explain things that they even can explain. That is why they invented the dark matter, the dark energy and so on and so forth. And we are just stacking, trying to explain their game, you know, without rules, and instead with uh, their rules. And their rules. Yeah. Like, yeah, and, and the, we are not compatible with that model of the universe. That's and right. that model of the universe is not compatible with us. So we're trying to mix all this together, and we are, you know, a Sunday <laughs> talking about this like forever. <laughs> yeah, yep. I agree. It can go round and round because it's it's really when you get to the sky and the, to the things we can't go to, it's an open slate, and they're able to input whatever they want. I mean, imagine that they've now said that you know ninety something percent of the known universe is something that cannot be detected. Well, that's just horseshit. It's just if you believe that, uh, you've simply adopted their line of thinking, you've adopted their religion, and are going to allow them to to say whatever they want about it, and you're just going to keep believing it. So it doesn't matter if tomorrow they say, oh, it's actually fifty percent dark uh, material and then there's also 45% of dark matter, people would still believe that because it's an open slate for them to write whatever their theoretical physicians or physicists, I mean, uh, want to write. Yeah, very good. And yeah, I agree with you. Obviously, they they do. They just keep moving the goalpost. And, you know, that's that a prime example of that is, of course, the dark matter and black holes and, um, you know, special relativity and bendy space and all this. They, they're constantly moving the the goalpost even to the point where they have uh, now essentially disregarded newton's model of of gravity and how it works and substitute it for the bendy space bendy time model of einstein um which of course is is really dumb and i think a lot of us can certainly agree on that but my position is and and i'm going to go back and and, and i want to show you a lot of definitions of gravity because you know got to be able to cite stuff like this and show actual you know definitions because as some people say words have meaning etc cetera, etc cetera. so this first definition of gravity noun in physics it is the force that attracts a body towards the center of the earth or towards any other physical body having mass okay so what I'm interested in here is their use of the word force, okay? Now, the reason that that a lot of physicists are and even globers are, are trying to get away from the word force um, is because of the Einstein explanation of bendy space and bendy time. Uh, they're trying to kind of distance themselves from the idea that, well, matter is just start attracting matter. And this is what causes the planetary uh, emotions and all that stuff. So in, in the days of old, in the days of Newton, uh, you know, before Einstein came out with this stuff, 
Virtually every reference to gravity referred to it as a force, the force of gravity. Um, they've simply changed, you know, the definition uh, of what it actually means at this point. So um, we'll look at that one. Now, the next thing we say, star child question of the month, what is gravity? We don't really know. We can define what it is as a field of influence because we know how it operates in the universe. Uh, and some scientists think that it is made up of particles called gravitons, um, which travel at the speed of light. However, if we are to be honest, we do not know what gravity is in any fundamental way. Uh, we only know how it behaves. Well, that's at least a little bit of an uh, honest answer. And the, notice this comes from nasa.gov. But then they say, here's what we do know. Gravity is a force of attraction that exists between any two masses. Now, I agree with that statement right up to here that it's a force of attraction, but it doesn't exist between any two masses. It only exists between the Earth and any other mass because in my model and I think in the, the model that I'm hoping to prove to you guys today, um, everything should be based you know, relative to Earth. So Earth, Earth is causing this either attraction force or as Eru said earlier, it could be pushing down, could be pulling down, whatever. But... Um, when you look at all of these definitions of gravity, especially in old school, they all include the word force. So let's look at another one. What is gravity? Okay, now in life science, it gets a little bit more towards Einstein, right? Uh, but it says gravity is the force that attracts two bodies towards each other, much like what uh, NASA just said before. Uh, the force that causes uh, apples to fall towards the ground and the planets to orbit in the sun. Well, yes, the force that causes the apples to fall towards the ground, I agree with. The planets to orbit the sun, no, I don't, because the planets, of course, in the flat Earth model, are not physical objects that are falling at, you know, warp eight around the sun, okay? So they say gravity is one of the four fundamental forces along with electromagnetic, strong, and weak forces. Okay, great. So what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of building up a case that you know, if nothing else, gravity has always been referred to historically and even in a lot of times today um, that, that, you know, gravity is a force. All right. There's another definition. Here's another definition from Wikipedia. Uh, gravity or gravitation is a natural phenomenon by which all things with mass or energy, including planets, stars, galaxies, and even light are brought towards or gravitate towards one another. On Earth, gravity gives weight to physical objects and the moon's gravity causing the ocean ties. Of course, all of that is complete nonsense, right? Again, because we're adopting the Einsteinian model <clears throat> and we are also assuming that the moon is a physical object and that the planets are physical objects that are influenced by this force, um, which, you know, obviously in the flat Earth model, they're not. So, uh, last one here, Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, gravity, gravity is also called gravitation in mechanics, the universal force of attraction, okay? So, that's in Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, let's start looking at what they define force as, because this is very integral to this explanation. Force in mechanics is any action that tends to maintain or alter the motion of a body uh, or to distort it. Okay, the concept of force is commonly explained in terms of Isaac Newton's three, no, three laws of motion set forth in his Principia Mathematica, 1687. According to Newton's first principle, a body that is at rest or moving at a uniform rate in a straight line will remain in that state until some force is applied to it. Okay, cool. I, I, I will agree with that. The second law says that when an external force acts on a body, it produces an acceleration. That's another important thing, you know, to understand what an acceleration is. And we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, a change in velocity uh, of the body in the direction of the force. Okay. So essentially what they're saying is that um, if you are in a car and you're doing 60 miles an hour, okay, uh, you have your own linear frame of reference and that works all good for, you know, relativity and frames of references. Um, but where things change is if you apply a force to the side of that car or turning the wheels, um, then you're essentially turning in a new direction or you're accelerating towards it. Okay. So that is where we get the idea of acceleration. 
But most people simply look at acceleration and they think it, you know, when you're in a car, you're sitting at a light, you hit the gas, you accelerate, you go. Okay. So the definition of acceleration in physics is the rate at which velocity changes with time in terms of both speed and direction. A point or an object moving in a straight line is accelerated if it speeds up or slows down. Uh, motion on a circle is accelerated even if the speed is constant because the direction is continually changing. For all other kinds of motion, both effects contribute to the acceleration. Okay, great. I agree with all that stuff, and I think you guys probably do too, um, at least as far as uh, Isaacs. And if you don't, speak now or forever hold your peace. Agreed. Hey, John, what's uh, happening? <laughs> hey, hey, guys, just popped in and uh, got, got to hear the Newton's laws of motion, so uh, good stuff. Okay, cool. Well, we're glad you made it uh, here with us. And so I'm just kind of going uh, over some definitions, um, yep. you know, before I actually, you know, make make my argument, um, because I think it's important. And again, I have the physics classroom talking about the force and the, it's the same basic thing. Uh, a force, forces only exist as a result of interaction. Okay, that's an, another very important thing. Uh, Wikipedia, same thing. In physics, a force is any inter interaction that, when unopposed, will change the motion of an object. A force can cause an object with mass to change its velocity, uh, which includes to begin moving from a straight state of rest, i.e. to accelerate. In other words, all objects have inertia, even if they're at rest. And that inertia must be overcome by a force, okay? And even when objects are in motion, they still have an inertia, and in order to change that inertia, uh, i.e. make a left or a right turn, a force must be applied. Okay? So, um, they also say, which includes, okay, let me go back to this. A force can cause an object with mass to change its velocity, which includes to begin moving from a state of rest, i.e. to accelerate. Okay? And that is a very, very important term also, the acceleration, okay? So let's look at the definition of acceleration. The act or process of moving faster or happening more quickly, the act of a process of accelerating. In physics, the rate of change of velocity with respect to time broadly or change of velocity. Okay, great. Another one, uh, we have accelerations in this one that says when the velocity of an object changes, it is said to be accelerating. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time. Uh, in everyday English, the word acceleration is often used to describe a state of increasing speed. For many Americans, their only experience with acceleration, experience with acceleration comes from car ads when the commercial shouts zero to 60 in 6.7 seconds. Uh, what what they're saying here is that a particular car takes 6.7 seconds to reach a speed of 60 miles uh, per hour starting from a complete stop. Okay, so an acceleration can either take place of an object already in motion um, and accelerating to a higher speed. It can take place from an object already in motion, changing direction, turning left or turning right, um, or an uh, acceleration... Uh, can be something that is like um, what is in the equation for gravity. Okay, now this part I talked about a little bit last week. Let me actually get past this. Okay, so I was talking a few weeks ago with Jaren, and I said that, that one of the things that I think is pretty difficult to um, bypass is the idea that that gravity is defined as an acceleration or one of the properties of gravity is an acceleration of uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. Now what that math tells us is that the acceleration that's going on is exponential, right? It's, it's going up at the rate of 9.8 meters per second squared, faster and faster and faster. It is accelerating. And one of the, uh, uh, examples that I used for that was, of course, um, uh, what's his name? I can't always forget. Felix Baumgartner that did the jump and, uh, you know, went beyond supersonic speed. So I, I kind of want to show people that really quick. Um, here it is right here. So let's look at this. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to watch what happens with Felix when he jumps out of this, this uh, capsule. And they're actually going to slap a meter on him and a, a speedometer on him to see how fast he's going. So let's go from here and let's watch this. All right. So he's about ready to step off. Let's get it up to that part where he's going to step off. Okay, so here he goes. I'm going to play the sound with it. Okay, so now, as you can see, um, his speed is accelerating. Obviously, he started at zero miles per hour, and he's now accelerating, and he is actually going to surpass supersonic, uh, and supersonic is lower speed up at that altitude than it is, uh, you know, down uh, towards Earth. So even though this speed that they lock in at is not supersonic at sea level, it is supersonic at the altitude that he is at, which, uh, so he's packed. Uh, topping out there at about 729 miles per hour. Okay. And then what actually starts to happen at that point is he starts coming into contact with the more dense atmosphere, which causes another type of acceleration, which is slowing him down until he gets to what is called terminal velocity, which is around 120 miles per hour. Okay. So that was one of the examples that I used. So there, there's proof. I mean, you could say this with CGI. I tend to think that it's probably real. Um, and, you know, you also know that if you drop something from very high, it starts out at zero in your hand and starts accelerating as it goes down. Um, whether or not it, it meets that criteria of it exactly 9.8 meters per second, well, I'm sure that could absolutely be measured somewhere. And, and so I'm not even going to well, question 9. that. Well, 9.8 meters per second is only in a vacuum. So nobody's right, right. claiming that's in the atmosphere or anybody's claiming that that's in the sky anywhere. Right, right. But even even in the non-vacuum, you know, high altitude, which is not a whole lot of atmosphere, you know, we can still see it happening. And we can also see an acceleration if we drop something from a building at sea level, right? Um, it's going to speed up until it hits that 120 mile an hour terminal velocity. And then it's going to, you know, accelerate downwards um, to you know, terminal velocity. Okay. But then so, it stops accelerating, right? Yeah. Then it stops accelerating and, and yeah, it kind of equalizes out at about, you know, 120 miles per hour. Okay. okay. All right. So very good. So that was the example that I use and I'm saying, okay, well, according to the strictest definition, and remember we just went over the definitions of these things, something caused Felix to, go from zero miles an hour uh, all the way up to 729 miles an hour and then back down to uh, roughly 120 miles an hour, okay? Now, Jaren's position and a lot of people's position would simply be that, well, he's, he's more dense than the air around him and therefore he's going to keep going down until he gets to something more dense than him, either the water or the land, which of course he will go splat or whatever, right? <laughs> and I'm losing my voice. This sucks. I hate this. <clears throat> I get a drink here. Yeah, I would I would explain it with relative mm. density. So yeah, okay. and, and also we, we are not we are we are not uh, leaving out another fact. So for example, it's not just produced. I, I believe that relative density is just like the pay, the playground to things happen. I mean what is causing the acceleration could be the own weight because he has mass and uh uh, it's like saying, okay, if I move my arm, uh, which, what, what is causing uh, causing my arm accelerate? Is a force or is a movement? Or is right. You well, know, weight, you know what I mean. Weight technically is defined as a force. Okay. Yeah, but technically that's but a problem. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's a, a problem, problem exactly because uh, weight is not a force. No, and, it's and not. You read it before. Any object at uh, it, even is it at rest has inertia. That for me is like, a, you know, if I'm at rest, I'm, a, I'm at rest. Right. I'm, well, yeah, I, I don't have inertia. That is in the relativity universe and all this so because we are moving, supposedly. Yeah. Right. And I always say, uh, but I, it doesn't have any sense in, in, in the flat earth, uh, you know, theory or not theory, reality. 
we are still because we are still. Right. You can we say we don't need to our, say we have inertia. Exactly. You can say our structure, molecular structure, is vibrating. So, but that doesn't have any relation with that kind of inertia that Newton talks about it. So, I mean, uh, the, the Felix van Garne champ. Yeah, clearly he is more dense than the air that is surrounded, and clearly we have an acceleration until he reach a point where is no more acceleration and we talked about this a few uh, shows ago and i have my trouble to explain myself talking about that but i i mean because we don't have a tube long enough to trying to produce some kind of vacuum and drop an object and and see if it still get more and more accelerating because the, there is a force uh, why he stop and somebody say no because the friction with the air prevent to keep accelerating okay right but we, we cannot test it the other thing we cannot test it the the, the uh, what happened if we can create some you know very high tube and put Felix and drop it in some cold vacuum and without any friction of the air what happened he's gonna keep accelerating yeah, right. and if, yeah. if in space would it be accelerating forever Right. But I think it can it can it can be described, and I guess I might be using the wrong word here. But when I use the word momentum, that no matter what, if you're more dense in the air around you, like Felix is here, and he starts to fall, if you have to be going faster in second two than you were going at second one because of momentum, there's no force that needs to pull you down. Nothing. It's just the fact that you're moving a certain speed and you're more dense than the area around you than the medium you're in causes you to move faster in second two than you were at second one, faster in second three than you were at second and two, faster in second four than three, so on and so forth. So, of course, you're going to build speed until your density changes. Now, when he gets towards the atmosphere, density changes. He's no longer going to move at that same speed because the density around him has changed, hence relative density. <laughs> okay. All right, fair enough, guys. Um, I will say that respectfully, I disagree with both of you, and, and I will say that weight on what, is... On what with, point? Several. Weight is a force. Okay. And again, I'm going to get to that as I remember, I am going to prove it. Okay. But I want to get this groundwork laid. All right. Um, but I'm going to tell you that, that what I'm presenting. You're saying though, real quick, you're saying weight by definition is force, correct? Absolutely. Okay. By definition, then uh, how am I going to disagree with you? Well, it's like you... red by definition is red. Okay, great. Weight by definition is well, because your weight, you're sitting on your chair right now. Are you not exerting a force downward onto your chair? Absolutely, because I'm much more dense than the medium in which I reside. That's right, but Absolutely. it's your weight. It's your weight that's causing it. What if you were, if you had a helium balloon sitting there that was basically at equilibrium sitting on your chair, um, you wouldn't be exerting nearly as much force, would you? Correct. Okay, so there you have it. That's why I'm saying that weight is absolutely a force. Okay, and so. My question would be, why uh, is the tendency for higher density objects to find their way down instead of up? I mean, there has to be some determining factor that uh, differentiates up from down. There is. Well, and, we already talked about that earlier, but... Uh, <laughs> that's okay. It's cool. <laughs> John can participate in this. There is John, and it's my contention that it is this thing, whatever it is that we're calling gravity, this downward accelerating force. And again, like I said, guys, I'm not making these statements idly. I am going to prove it, okay? But I want to get through this groundwork first, okay? All right, we'll let you get through it. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So... Basically, you have some questions here about acceleration and force. Um, and the the general idea, even though there's some, you know, kind of uh, fumbling around, uh, but, you know, in Quora, is it valid to state that force causes acceleration? And you have a few answers that kind of make sense, some that make no sense whatsoever. And then you have simply uh, one answer right here which is submitted by Jess H. Brewer, Professor Emeritus, Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of British Columbia. He simply says, yes. Okay, that's the, that's the easy answer, okay? Is it valid to state that force causes acceleration? Absolutely, and we can, we can do that. You know, if I'm, uh, when, when Jaron was little and, and he had his bike, right, and I'm teaching him how to ride a bike, 
um, I'm applying a force on the back of his seat that he can accelerate, you know, and then he can ride his bike. Uh, or you, when you're driving your car, you're putting a force on the rear wheels that causes an acceleration. Or when you're driving a car and you turn and you're putting a force essentially on the ground, which is causing a lateral acceleration, which again is a, a, a force. Now, when you, when you talk about things that are that have inertia okay everything has an inertia now just because you know, a lot of people will say well inertia that must mean that uh yeah it's only, only applies to objects that are moving no that's not true the inertia like for example if you have a car that's sitting there and, and the and the engine won't run and you've got it in neutral and you've got to push it well it's got an inertia right there that you've got to overcome by pushing to get it to go into motion Okay, by the same token, once you get that car into motion and it is movement and it has momentum and momentum and inertia are not the same thing, guys. But once it has that momentum, it also still has an inertia. And in order to change that inertia, you must apply a force to either accelerate it um, or uh, speed it up, slow it down or turn left or turn right. Okay. Okay. So I think we can all relate to that. Is there any objections to that line of thinking? No, not nice terminology. Okay, cool. And again, I'm not trying to be argumentative here. I'm simply trying to outline, you know, a case and how things are, are, are defined. Because like I said, it's my opinion that, you know, the definitions of, you know, gravity being a force back in the old day was absolutely... Uh, correct. And of course, it's been replaced these days with the word acceleration, with dielectric acceleration. But like I said, any acceleration, as we have just covered, requires a force. Okay. Now, is it valid to state that a force causes acceleration? Yes. And I can, I can cite this all day long, guys. So just take me at my word that I can do that. And I think you know that I can. All right. But that's, that's just another stepping stone as to where we're going. Okay. So um, now I want to, what I want you guys to do is I want you to participate in a thought experiment. But before we do that, Jern, I want you to, to explain to me why precisely you think that uh, density or relative density is all that is required and that no force is needed whatsoever um, to make the world go around, so to speak. <laughs> So if you do, I think I already some... have. I don't think I need to bring up definitions of words. I don't think I need to bring up. No, uh, no you don't. I just want to know your general take on it. You know, nothing, you know, I just want to know. I'm not even going to try and fight with you about it. I just want to hear what you have to say. I think I already described it. I don't know why we'd have to go over it again. I, I told you that if we consider the density of air as the number one, then everything that has a density greater than that one is going to fall down in that medium and everything that has a lesser density than one is going to rise in that medium. Now, again, if John wants to come and say, well, why do things go down? There has to be a preferential direction of down. Well, there doesn't because no matter what items in disequilibrium, no matter which direction they went and they have to go in a direction, that would be the direction that we would call down. That's the direction that earth and rocks and grass and weeds and everything would be. And that's the direction that the oceans would be in the lakes. And that's the place our feet would be. So no matter where it went, we would be calling it down. So to say, why don't things go up is to me an absolute uh, ridiculous statement. I mean, I just like, how could you say that? No matter where we were existing, no matter where it was, we would call where our feet were down. So the fact that you can take a golf ball and put it in the air, at some, it, it's, in disequilibrium. it's in disequilibrium. That golf ball has to go somewhere. And like Iru said, there's an order to the universe. So trying to describe why it goes in that direction is just ridiculous to me. It has to go somewhere, and whatever direction that went would be where all the earth would be, would be where the most dense items would be, like the oceans, like rocks, like, uh, you know, basalt, like, you know, concrete, like everything that there is that's more dense than the air it's in would go in that direction. That would become down. So relative density and just what I just explained without having to go through little definitions, without having to say, well, this is what force equals, and this is what acceleration equals, and this is what Newton said, and this is what Einstein came and said. I don't need any of that. And I think the universe is much more simple than that. I don't need to follow the directions let for me or left for me by these guys saying, well, this is what a force is and it has to equal this and acceleration can only happen because of a force and everything has inertia. To me, I don't need any of that. It's relative density. So that's yeah, my the explanation. Pro 
Okay. Yeah, I, and, and, and like in that is why I, I talk at the beginning that I am 1.5, if you want to see that way. But because we cannot test it, what happens if we take out the Earth? For example, if Correct. the present of the Earth is not here, uh, where the object goes? It goes somewhere or not? So we cannot, it, it, that, that is why it's like a philosophical <laughs> speaking uh, or, or the, you know, uh, a talk, a talk. It's like a philosophical talk because we cannot we, test it. Right, the, we exist where the Earth is. Dependent variables on each model. Correct, and the Earth that is, is here. Why, what, right, the Earth, the, I said the Earth is here. This, exactly. this is the place that we live. So exactly. to, to try and come up with this is what they want you to do in the globe Earth. They want to say, well, you're out in space and you're in orbit of the sun and you're, we don't need any of that. The Earth exactly. is where we exist, and so we can't test things outside of this. Now, you can go create a vacuum, and you can say, well, and that's what they tried to do. That's what Newton and them tried to do. They tried to see an apple falling and say, well, the same thing that causes that apple to fall must cause the moon to fall towards the Earth, <clears throat> and since the sun is so much bigger than us, must call, uh, cause us to fall around the sun. I don't need any of that. that that's all uh, them trying to explain the universe in a way I don't think it needs to be explained. I think you know when you just look at the fact that the apple's hanging on the tree, it didn't get there by chance. It got there because the tree grew up. It produced an apple. It's hanging on to that apple by its stem. And the second that it, whatever causes that apple to fall, whether it's wind, whether it's somebody comes and grabs it, whether it's a ball hits the branch and breaks it, at that moment, it the apple weighs more. It's more dense than the medium it's in, and it has to go somewhere. That direction is where we stand. That direction is Earth. That's where we live, and we will always call that down. So to say... Why doesn't it go to the right? Why doesn't it go to the left? Well, if things went to the right, that's where the earth would be. And actually, that's where the apple would have grown from. So just like the apple goes back to where it was grown from, the same thing is true. If it went right, then the tree came from the right, which means we'd be standing on the right, which means we as humans would call that down. Okay. Well, Fair enough. You know, and I, I see what you're saying, uh, Jaron. I definitely do. But, like, what I would ask is what is the difference between up and down? Like there must be some difference, uh, natural, physical principle of reality that uh, causes, you know, high density objects to fall and lower density objects to rise. So, I mean, we can all agree that there is a difference between up and down, at, surely. So Correct. Wh what is that natural principle that uh, causes that difference? I would say it's most dense versus least dense. The the most dense direction is the ground. That's where it, it has to be. It has to have gone somewhere. There's has to be. Otherwise, if there was just disequilibrium and things went wherever the hell they wanted, there could be no structure to the earth that we live on. There could be no world for us to reside in. Things would go everywhere. Your atoms would move every different direction. Your your head would, you know, you couldn't exist. So there has to be some order. And that order is simply sorted by relative density. So th that... And the fact that the Earth exists, that would be the most dense thing. I mean, there's, you know, if something is less dense than the air that exists below my feet, then it's trapped there. Because if it was let go of there, it would certainly rise. It would come back to, to, to equilibrium. Everything wants to be in equilibrium. But the fact that there's uh, a lot of forces going on and the sun's heating up the atmosphere and causing different elements and gases to uh, rise up, to become more dense, and then they get cooler and they come back down and causes the cycles of air. The fact that rocks here, rocks are in equilibrium when they're on the ground because that's where their density has led them to reside. Okay, cool. Fair enough. All right, hopefully that was a good enough explanation. That, I, I, that, okay, was, that was just dandy, Jaron. That was absolutely dandy. Um, and uh, obviously I agree with you on all of it except for, of course, what is causing the acceleration towards down. That's where we differ. But anyway, let's move on. All right, so... Let me I, let me ask let me ask one question there because you said you agree with everything except for the acceleration. So if, like I said, a golf ball exists in air and it has to go in some direction, let's all call that down. Let's say things go to that down direction. We can all agree on that. Don't you mm -hmm. agree that as it started to fall, as it started to move to find its equilibrium when it hit the ground, that it would have to be going faster in second two than second one? Absolutely. Okay. Well, then you do agree with the fact that acceleration can be explained through relative density. Why would why would do I need a force pulling at that golf ball at a constant or not constant at some sort of varying force? Couldn't it just be that the well, item has been displaced from its equilibrium? Well, 
No, no? but right. I, I will I will get to that. And like I said, I'm going to prove this. Uh, but right, I'm waiting. <laughs> I just want I know you are, and so is everybody else. And believe me, I'm not I'm not making this crap up. I I have proof, and I'm going to you know present it. But I, I just kind of let's well, just say I want to set you up, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. Go, no, let me ask you something. Go ahead, you, you believe there is that you you believe there is some force attracting or pushing? Uh, I believe it's attracting. Okay, perfect. Okay, but. but you believe, but you, you, if it's proven, then it's, you know, right. beyond belief, right? Then, right. then I can say, I know it's attracting. Okay. But, okay. It, you know, I, I, I just don't want to go to absolutes until I present my proof because I think it's going to kind of stun everybody. Um, and so, so why, why set us up though? I mean, why? I, I because, don't really because. I understand the purpose of that. Like just to show that you're right and we're wrong. I no, guess I can't really no, no, really it is not. Jern, Jern, you're getting defensive, buddy. I, this well, is not about being. Well, I'm say, setting. All right, uh, th maybe that was the wrong term. I'm setting up. Okay. I'm setting up the scenario. Okay, I didn't mean I say I'm setting you up. I was like, yeah. ha, 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 I got you. No, that isn't right. that isn't what I meant. I'm sorry if you took it that way. All right. Well, it sounded like you said I'm setting you guys up and kind of chuckled. That's exa that's exactly. If you rewind the tape, that's what you did. Uh, well, <laughs> so okay. I'm just saying if you have proof, all right. and, and maybe maybe a little bit. Okay. Maybe a little so, bit. All right. All right. But, I'll let you go. go okay. Just just let me have my my moment. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so it is your your contention then, Jaron, that um, you've you've seen the uh, you've seen the uh, density towers, right? And you you've seen that they have the density towers that have all this different uh, liquid material. That's you know one is more viscous than the other, and of course then they layer, right? Absolutely. And then you've seen like uh, the example like Anthony Riley likes to use, where he drops a cherry into it and it goes down. I don't know four or five levels, and then it just stops there because it has hit its equilibrium uh, with a rel with, with, with a dense with a material density that is equal to its own uh, correct is that that that's where you're yeah, coming from I think that's okay. where I'm yeah, I guess I don't know if that's where I'm coming from but I understand the density tower and I understand that things layer themselves as per their density is that what you mean yeah okay. exactly gotcha I agree okay Cool. All right. So we're still we're still going good here. And notice, you know, I haven't lost my cool. And, and you know, because I'm very confident in this. I just, and like I said, I want you guys to really, really think this through. Okay. So now I want to take you through a thought experiment. And this thought experiment, you know, as I told you on the phone the other day, um, is where I'm going to take this thought experiment. Uh, and I'm going to ask you all to use your imagination, meaning that no, I'm not saying this is real, not exactly, but I want to, I want you to use your imagination and the venue for this thought experiment is going to be some place that we've all been indoctrinated to believe is there and, um, you know, even understand kind of the physics of it a little bit, right? Because of our Star Trek and our Star Wars and stuff like that. So this thought experiment is going to take place in outer space. Okay. So imagine yourself and remember I said, imagine, all right. Imagine yourself in the middle of space and there's no bodies around you, no stars, no heaven. You're just there in your spacesuit, you know, kind of like a scene right out of gravity. Right. And you're just floating there, but in your hand, you have a hammer. Okay. And the first thing I want you to imagine is if you take that hammer and you hold it out at arm's length and you let it go, what's going to happen? You you are talking about the the kind of expert. You, you are more imaginative than than Sean Lennon, first of all. But yes, yes. I, hey, I said this was an imagination thing. All right. <laughs> no, I know that. I, know I, that. I acknowledge this fully, but I have a point. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. No, you are talking about like the thought of experiment of Albert Einstein. You know, like. Uh, uh, if you are, if you don't have any reference, you know, to compare, and you are falling or accelerating upwards uh, in the in the space, and you drop an up, it's like be in the zero g plane or free falling plane. Okay, if that's the way you want to look at it, that's fine. Same principle. So essentially, what we're doing is we're we're removing this gravity thing out of the equation, right? Like in a zero g plane. <clears throat> so you didn't answer my question though. If I hold that hammer out at arm's length and I let it go, what's going to happen? It's going to be with me. It, 
it's going to be there. In other words, it's just going to sit there, right? It's not going to do anything, right? Supposedly. Yeah, of course, okay. theoret theoretically. So, uh, come yeah, on, don't be afraid. Like... Don't be afraid to, no, no, to speak no, no. out, guys. Yeah, yeah. This is just an imaginary thing. It's just a yeah, thought yeah, experiment. Yeah. And believe me, I'm going to bring this home to a real life situation. Okay. So <laughs> that's why I want to do this. This imagine it. Okay. Now, let's say you had a ball bearing, right? Same thing. Instead of the hammer, you got a ball bearing. You hold it out. Uh, you're floating in space. You let go of the ball bearing. What's the ball bearing going to do? What is a ball bearing, first of all, for me? It's just a steel ball. Essentially. Oh, okay. Oh, steel. Yeah. So what's it going to do uh, when you let it go? But you, you, you said the uh, initial conditions uh, was we are accelerating or... or no, moving. I didn't say that. I said you're just floating in space. Floating. Floating in space. Yes. It's, 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 it's been floating. Okay, for so me, that is my, my opinion. I mean, so you're saying you're saying then that the, the the ball bearing when you let go of it, it's just going to float there, right? If I don't, if I don't impress uh, any force, if, if I have the magical properties of let go explicitly, you know, yes. just I open my, my my fingers and 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 I don't you know push or or move nothing. Uh, I I assume it's going to be. Uh, to my side at the same right. place that I let go. You're right. That's that's pretty much what would happen. Okay, now let's expand on this a little bit. <clears throat> now, let's say in your right hand, you've got that same ball bearing and your left hand, uh, you're going to put below it or to the side of it or above it or to the right of it. It doesn't matter. This time, you're going to take a neodymium magnet and you're going to put it somewhere. Uh, let's just say below it for example, all right? So you you have the ball bearing in your right hand, you have the neodymium magnet in your left hand, you hold them both out at arm's length and you let them go at the same time. Now what's gonna happen? Well, without any uh, medium, nothing. If you don't have permeability, I mean, if you don't have any agent to transfer the magnetism, nothing is gonna happen. So you're saying then, Eru, that, that the magnetic field would not work in a vacuum is that what you're asserting i'm saying i'm saying that in the terms that the vacuum is completely the out of any kind of property not the vacuum because you pick up a chamber uh you vacuum chamber here on earth with uh, you know that uh, toy chamber that the youtubers use to the say oh here is in the vacuum we can do that but not because that is a toy it's not the vacuum chamber and it's not the what the vacuum you propose so okay. we don't have we, we so don't you're, have that so you're saying that because it's a vacuum that somehow now the magnetic force or the magnetic the magnet is no longer going to work because there's a vacuum is that that's that's what you're saying right because yeah because it's out no i'm i'm saying that i am more in the tesla uh sort of you know sort of experiment thought which he said that if the space is what uh, is empty is empty of any kind of properties so for me if if, if even can exist if the if the space can hold any properties yeah but and the space in this case is just more or less a vacuum obviously in the heliocentric model right there's there's some properties there's gas particles there's stuff like that but even in even if we created an artificial vacuum here on earth um, and we put two magnets inside of it, I guarantee you they are going to attract to each other in, in, yeah, in an artificial and I vacuum. I saw that, but I, I, don't, I don't believe that is the, the kind of vacuum that oh, we are God. talking about. You guys are really but making I this a difficult <laughs> No, <laughs> but experiment. I understand your point. I, I understand okay, your good. point. Okay, good. Then if you understand my point, then what's going yeah. to happen when I release the, the, the steel ball and the neodymium magnet at the same time? What is going to happen? They're going to attract and, each other. Yeah. If all there the you go. Okay. That was the answer that I was looking for. Okay. Well, and did you say that you had one in each hand or they were both in the same hand? No, one in each hand and they're roughly a foot okay. apart, but we're using a new oh, okay. magnet, so it's really strong. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. This is a yeah. special, special new magnet. Okay. Agreed. So yeah, they, they would attract for sure. Okay, cool. Based on everything we've been told, uh, or we can pretend. That's right. That's why we're yeah. imag that's why we're imagining. That's imagining. why we're using our imagination. Believe me, I'm going to bring this home. 
All right. Okay. Okay. So now let's say I had a container and inside of it had a little bit of water, a little bit of motor oil, a little bit of salad dressing. In other words, say I had this, this density tower in space, okay, or whatever. And I just poured these ingredients into it. And again, on the top of the density tower, I have my ball bearing. And on the bottom of the density tower, I have my neodymium magnet. And let's just say at the bottom of the density tower, I also have a layer of ice. Okay, so I've added that in. So now when I release the ball bearing and the magnet and we have our density tower in between it, now what's going to happen? Use your imagination. The ball bearing is going to travel through the the layers until it hits the ice. Yeah, and is the ice a butt like between the two? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would say that's the same. Okay, good. Very if good. We're, if we're making believe. If we're making believe. We are making believe here. Absolutely okay. we're making believe. All right. So you guys all are in agreement that it's gonna go through those liquids, the motor oil, the water, the vegetable oil, until it hits the ice, and then it's going to stop its acceleration towards the magnet. We're on the same page with that, yes? Sure. Yep. Okay, cool. Now, I want you to think about, um, if you have that density tower itself, and you don't have any magnets uh, in line with it, no magnet, uh, nothing like that. You have a density tower then in space, um, just like the one that Sleeping Warrior likes to use with the like 14 different layers of something. And you have that cherry, okay? And you have the cherry above the density tower, no magnets, no nothing like that. And you let go of that cherry. Now what's going to happen with the cherry? I have no idea. It's probably I would just... say I would say that it wouldn't move at all. You're right. It wouldn't. Yeah. And why wouldn't it move? Because there's no force or acceleration applied to it um, to cause it to move. Very good. That's exactly right. Now, I want you to think about if you took all those things, the, the, the motor oil, the water, the juice, the, the honey, whatever, and you shook it all up and you're in outer space, and then you just let it go at arm's length, what would happen to the density tower. What's going to happen to the liquids inside of it? I would say the like liquids would randomly sort of coalesce into little bubble, uh, little spheres, if you will. Um, but you wouldn't get the sort of uh, layers that you would expect here on Earth. You're exactly right. So why? Why wouldn't you get those layers? Well, because you don't have any quote-unquote gravity uh, that, that you have here on the ground. So you have no downward accelerating force, right? Right. Okay, cool. Fair enough. Now, let's bring this down to Earth, guys. Let's well, get out of all, imagination. Are we, are we in agreement on this, on uh, this are, point? Yes, or? are we all in agreement on these points in imagination land, guys? In imagination land, sure. Excellent. Let's bring it home. All right. Now, <clears throat> if you are on, now I'm going to take us out of outer space and I'm just going to bring us right back here to Earth. All right. And I'm going to bring up a video and I'm going to show you something here that I think you're going to kind of be amazed at. Now, again, in space, we determined that the nothing the, the the liquids would not separate because there's no downward force. Uh, there's no there's no force essentially that is causing um, the liquids to separate and form into the density tower. Now I'm going to play a video here, and I want you guys to pay very close attention to this, especially the last thing that the guy says. Now this is a college project that was done on a vomit comet. This is not imagination land. This is real life, but let's watch and see what happens. The middle school experiment mixes oil and water to show that oil floats on top of the water. This happens because the two fluids are A, immiscible, that is they do not mix, and B, different densities. 
a quarter cup of oil weighs less than a quarter cup of water, and so the oil sits on top of the water. Why is the oil on top? The answer is intuitive. Heavy things sink down and light things float up because gravity pulls on the heavy things harder. But what happens when the g-force goes away? Well, if we don't have a down, we don't have an up, and so who knows what will happen. Carthage College's microgravity team explored what happened in August 2013 with some help from NASA. To figure this out, we need two things, a density tower and a zero-g environment. The first item is pretty easy to obtain, and we don't need to use only two fluids. Some enthusiastic scientists have created these density towers with nine different fluids. Okay, and this, of course, is the density tower that, that uh, Sleeping Warrior likes to use with the dish soap water, everything, and the cherry in between and all that stuff. And as you can see, you know, here on Earth, with a downward force, the, the uh, layers, the honey corn syrup and everything, uh, layer perfectly. Okay, so let's continue on. Or the, or the pushing force. What, whatever. <laughs> I'm not even going to argue yeah. that point. Yeah. Well, okay, so here we go. And they behave pretty well as long as they aren't jostled too much. Here is a tower with three immiscible fluids. Vegetable oil, water with blue food coloring, and some leftover FC-72 we had in the lab. FC-72 is an experimental spacecraft coolant. It performs the exact same job as car coolant, just in space. Links in the description for more about FC-72. The zero-g environment is a bit harder to come by. Thankfully, Carthage College had been selected by NASA to perform a different experiment with FC-72 in zero-g. To perform zero-g experiments, NASA uses G-Force-1, the microgravity plane. To make zero-g, G-Force-1 flies in a parabolic shape. That is, they go up in the air at full speed and then cut the engines to fall to Earth before turning the engines back on and repeating the whole process over and over again. The Carthage College microgravity team took the three fluid density tower aboard G-Force 1 when they went to Ellington Field in Houston, Texas to perform their FC-72 experiment for NASA. In the footage that follows, you'll mostly see John Robinson and Eli Favela handling the density tower. Before we get rolling with the footage, here are three tips for successfully coping with zero-g. Number one, find a nice place to lay or sit on the plane. Why? Because when the plane is catching itself, everyone experiences two g's of force, and so it feels like a clone of you is sitting on top of you. And it's best to take that like a rug, laying sprawled out. Tip two, watch your feet. Amateurs flail their feet to try to stabilize. Astronauts like Clay Anderson calmly fly above the chaos. Tip three, the hypergravity portion of the flight is an excellent time to do push-ups and sit-ups if you didn't have time to work out because of all the science you were doing. Okay, let's turn it over to John to see the fluid in action. This is the density tower. It's got different liquids, different densities. So right now we're in the hypergravity, so they're really separate. So we have FC72, water, and vegetable oil. Then as soon as we hit zero, as soon as we go into microgravity, well, you'll see. That was a bit tough to see as John started to float away with the tower, but did you see the way it oozed? Let's see it on the next parabola, once John has strapped himself down a bit. Did you see how the fluid didn't separate out like it did in normal gravity and hypergravity? And did you see the different color blobs just cycle around? Watch it one last time as John swishes it up going into zero G. Zero.
conclusion, when we take away gravity, we take away up and down. With no sense of direction, neatly ordered systems like our density tower start acting all chaotic, with everything going in all directions. And that is pretty cool. And that Our, is why an astronaut can survive in the uh, microgravity. Right. All right, guys. So With what did we just... Blood inside all right, guys. So doing that. What did we just see here? Well, I'll tell you what we just saw here. We saw the downward accelerating force caused by what we are calling gravity being taken away, much like in the thought experiment in space. And John the Morgal was absolutely correct when he said that when you take away that downward force, then the liquids will not separate. So uh, my earlier assertion of what I said that I wanted to prove here <clears throat> is that to show without the so-called force acceleration effect phenomenon of gravity, the concept of relative density and buoyancy are rendered moot. Okay? You just saw it. We have removed that downward force and now all of a sudden density and buoyancy don't cut it anymore because the the liquids are not separating there you have it guys there is your nuke and i have more examples than just this i have many more examples but i, I want to hear your comments on this so that plane isn't falling the plane is just uh floating in space it, it's falling it's falling okay, essentially so it's falling it's falling and it's it's essentially eliminating right. the gravitational force, much like we did in the space thought experiment. The exact same thing happened. It's just the, a falling frame of reference. The zero G plane is not in zero G. Anybody who tells you that is completely confused. It gives the illusion of yes. zero G. And he mixed up the density tower. The very first thing he does is mix it up. I'll go do that right now. I'll grab a, a, a glass of those things. I'll have them separate out. And then I'll tip it upside down and mix it and then show you. Look how it's swirling around and not separating out. <laughs> yes, he mixed it up for a reason to show you that in the zero G, it will not relayer according to density. In other words, that density gradient has been rendered moot without the downward force or by quasi removing it, just like the thought experiment. The same thing. Now, if you want more proof, I can certainly go there. But well, it, I, I would say real quick too, uh, when the plane leveled out, the uh, the liquids separated pretty quickly, like within a couple seconds, I guess, because of the extra uh, forces. You know, because for when you're at the end of that parabola, that at the end of that curve, you get double the regular acceleration of uh, quote unquote gravity. Right. So it was a yes. little. It was they separated very quickly. Right. And as soon as as soon as gravity was restored or they came out of that downward dive, then all of a sudden de relative density uh, fell into place and it layered those liquids accordingly. OK, so that's yeah. Granted, we can't just turn gravity off, but we can essentially do that um, by negating the force by accelerating towards it. Um, therefore, we have then removed the downward force from that density tower and the liquids simply would not arrange themselves into densities. Now, obviously you're still skeptical. So let's look at something else. Let's look at something called, let me find it. Let me find it. Uh, and uh, feel free to uh, talk amongst yourself as soon as I find it. God, I have so many freaking links. It's unbelievable. Uh, Oh, here we go. Well, okay. I, I would just say that, yeah, while while the the zero G plane isn't taking away gravity, it does um, basically get rid of weight. So it it simulates taking away gravity, right? Exactly. It gets rid of the weight, and, and, and which, of course, as I said earlier, was a force. Now let's look at another device. Now these are interesting, guys. This is called a gravimeter, and uh, as the name might imply. It says a gravity a gravimeter is an instrument used to measure gravitational acceleration. Every mass has an has an associated gravitational potential. The gradient of this potential is a force. The gravimeter measures this gravitational force. Okay, now, first of all, uh, you know, as you said, the first gravimeters were vertical accelerometers, and accelerometers also. Uh, will will blow away completely the idea of relative density. But let me tell you, let me explain to you how this gravimeter works. And by the way, these are like sixteen, twenty thousand dollar pieces of equipment. Um, and believe it or not, 
they work on based on laser interferometry. Okay, so how does it work? All right, I'll tell you how it works. Inside of this box, there is a tube that has a uh, that is that is evacuated. That is a complete vacuum inside of it. And inside of it, they have an object that they can cue and make go up and down, essentially. And what happens is, is the laser interferometer, uh, just like it does on LIGO, tracks the length of that uh, tube, okay? And when an object is dropped from the top of that tube down towards the bottom where the force is, it will accelerate at a very specific speed. Now, the reason it's a gravimeter is because there are places on earth, believe it or not, that the gravity varies slightly from one place to another, okay, or the downward pulling force. And believe me, guys, I hate using the term gravity as much as you do. Um, well, but so, yeah, I know. So when I say gravity, just, just substitute in the downward acceleration or the downward force, okay, because that's essentially, you know, what we just showed is, is going on here. So then... What the accelerometer does is when you drop this object through the evacuated tube, um, it will accelerate and it will hit the bottom of that tube at a very precise uh, time interval, okay? Meaning that you can then extrapolate the acceleration and how fast it's going inside, okay? And, and obviously because it's a laser interferometer and we have covered how interferometry works, it is unbelievably accurate. Okay, I mean, uh, saying that a ten thousandth of a width of a hair is 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 nothing for this thing. I mean, it's way, way, way accurate. So, essentially, what it's measuring again is this acceleration force that's going downwards, and it varies from place to place. Gravity, our buoyancy and density, have no role in this whatsoever because it is doing this acceleration through this tube that is completely evacuated. It is a vacuum, okay? No atmosphere, no medium of any kind whatsoever um, to interfere or prohibit the dropping of the object that goes down to it, okay? So, so it goes at 9.8 meters per second squared? Roughly, and they say that. Yeah, you roughly. Know, plus of course or minus. it doesn't because it is made on Earth and it's an evacuated tube, so it's not as strong as a vacuum, so they can't... So, I mean, as far as it being accurate, it's created here on Earth. It's not created in space. It's not created sideways. It's created where they know the rate at which something falls in that tube. It doesn't prove that there's gravity involved. It doesn't prove there's a downward force. And I don't understand how you right. say there's no density or... You said there's no density involved. There's there isn't. There's something dropped... There isn't. There's there's, it, the the, the a... medium is a vacuum, Jaron. There's no density okay. involved. Right. But no, what is dropped in it? I don't know. Sure some sort of a metal dropped. object? Right, and I'm sure that metal object has density. Of I'm course sure it does, take... but the, the, what sure. it's traveling said, through... Hold on. Hold on. Let's just Jaren, stop don't, don't do semantics here. Yes, semantics. I, said, I said that the object is dropping through it. That's correct. Right. But it what density, it's right? dropping through is no medium. Okay. There's nothing. In other words, like the cherry calculated? has. Can it be calculated? Yes. Can it be calculated? Okay. Then that's all you need. So relative density explains it. You have an item that falls in an evacuated tube at a certain speed. You can calculate it. You can program it with 9.8 meters per second. You can program it with weight is whatever, and it will give you a reading. It's very accurate. Okay, great. So then, then how do you explain then that it gives you a different reading in a different place on earth that has a slightly different gravitational constant? How do you explain that with buoyancy and density? I have no idea. That's right. You don't because no, I've never seen that. Never seen that done. That it, you can take uh, this uh, to somewhere else. I've oh never seen God. it. So now, now we're going to deny it because you haven't seen it done. Yeah, I've never seen this thing. If it goes somewhere else, I don't know what's going on. Is it measuring some sort of energy from the ether that uh, might change in different locations? How would I know that? Well, if it didn't, then this entire piece of equipment is a complete waste of money. All right. <laughs> uh, so there what, is it, are, what is it used for? I don't get what it's used for then. It's used to detect differences in the downward force on different places in the earth. That is what it, that's why it's called a gravimeter because it and detects downward force and the variances in it from place to place. And what we can apply in real life. 
this is yeah, real right. life. This is We're real life. No, where can we apply that? Like, so you I can mean, take it next to the ocean and get a different reading because of the gravity of the tides is pulling no, one direction. If you're gonna build a, if you wanna construct a building and there is difference in these uh, parameters, you need to put more uh, concrete. For example, I mean, what is the uh, real what is application? The application of it? Exactly. What, he's asking, what is the application? What is the application of it? I don't well, know. I mean, so, Maybe. So, the moon, so the moon would affect this greatly, depending on whether the moon is full, whether it's half, whether it's coming around, whether it's behind you. It would make a huge difference in that, correct? Just the same thing as the moon would have had a huge difference in the um, Cavendish experiment, which he didn't include, didn't even include it in his paperwork at all. Well, I guess if we're assuming that the moon has gravity, then yeah, it probably would. But since the moon cannot possibly have gravity, then I don't think it would affect it at all. But if but if this meter does what it's said to do, if we can just move it to different locations and it's able to detect a change, a slight change, I forgot what Bob said, one ten millionth of a something. Um, yeah, it's ridiculously accurate. So yeah, so then the moon would have huge effects on it. The moon is able to to bring water. Well, to the- that's that's assuming, yeah, that's assuming the moon, but it doesn't. I mean, the moon doesn't affect LIGO, and therefore that tells us that the moon is not a physical object. I'm talking strictly here on flat Earth, okay? Gotcha. I'm not talking about any ball model. I'm talking about reality here on flat Earth. And there gotcha. are differences in acceleration, this downward acceleration force across the plane. And I will tell you this also, these gravitational anomalies, as they are so-called, are almost always accompanied by a magnetic anomaly. Okay? So... Gotcha. I, I just so, don't think we could we could really know what the exact cause of that is. It's just like... It, it's just it, like it, you're right. I'm not, I'm not claiming... the earth. Right, I'm not right. claiming to know what the cause is. All I'm saying is that this is that something that is measurable. It is something that we just demonstrated that density and buoyancy are the relative density argument is rendered moot, completely moot without a downward force. That is the point here. Without that downward force, dense, the relative I'm density glad. means nothing Oof. because the tower is completely uh, scrambled up. They will not layer into, they will not order into layers because you do not have a, a, a bias towards down to determine up from down to even allow density and buoyancy to work. Therefore, I'm saying that the thought experiment, the, the vomit comet, and the gravimeter all demonstrate very, very clearly that there must be a downward force. Whatever it is, it's there. I don't know. Yeah, just because the plane is falling downward because of its density and because of the medium it's in, and everybody inside it is falling downward. And so when you have a density tower and you mix it up and then you say, oh, well, because we're all falling downward, it won't organize itself. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that things organize themselves immediately. It takes time, just like the atmosphere. Otherwise, there would be layers of the atmosphere. Our atmosphere doesn't work as a density tower. Why not? Because there's a lot of other things going on. Our atmosphere so many different does around. work as a density tower. It most certainly does. With does the noble, it, with our, the noble gases it? at the top and the heavier gases, like you said earlier, like ozone at the bottom, and then there is a whole... Can, there's a whole density layer of different gases at different uh, elevations. You said it yourself, Jaron. The ozone's ozone at the bottom, the and we know that ozone helium. The, all right, ozone goes to the top. All right, it's helium, the heaviest gas, and it's at the top. What do you why, mean? Why, why would ozone, being the heaviest gas, go all the way to the top of the atmosphere? That That's makes what it no does sense because of the cycle. No, well, the lightest the gas it... goes to the top, Jaron. Helium goes to the top, or hydrogen. Hold on, you've got it backwards. No, no, no. It, what is our atmosphere made up of? Oxygen, uh, oxygen argon, argon, nitrogen, neon. So which one of those is more dense? Out of the what? Should layer. Oxygen, argon, nitrogen. or you know, Those don't layer by, by density They're because of the, the fact that they heat up, because there's the sun, because there's an yes. atmosphere that's always mixing that. Okay. Well, All right. Ozone that, goes that, to the top. That's fine. Ozone is heavier. Ozone's heavier than oxygen. Well, if it's heavier... Uh, okay, but but we also know that helium and yes. hydrogen are noble gases, as are neon and you know several other gases, and they are up in the very top layers of the atmosphere, Correct. right? Because they so don't there is a density heat. gradient in the atmosphere. 
The, the, you can't argue that. There is a density gradient. What I'm saying is they don't layer themselves like the density tower. It's not because, I mean, do you realize what we're breathing is not all of one thing? It's not just. Yes, oxygen. I do realize that. And I okay. also know so that there's it's, not a tower. It's, it's constantly being mixed. But uh, overall, there is a general density gradient. Just like, remember, remember Zach's experiment uh, when he was trying to show, uh, you know, the Globers, you know, they were saying, well, uh, you, you, I mean, a flat earth claim, and I agree with it, you cannot have a, a, a pressurized system next to a vacuum. Great. And then remember Zach, uh, good times for all experiment, where he took and he had a can of some sort of gas. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was propane. But then he put a pressure gauge at the bottom of it and a pressure gauge at the top of it, right? And what he saw was, is that at the bottom of it, there was a slightly higher pressure than there was at the top. Why is that? Why is that? Is it, it couldn't be because they're, you're layering densities because it was all one gas. The reason it did that, guys, is because there is a downward accelerating point and it, it pulls that gas downward to a point where it is compressed slightly at the bottom, making it more dense. And then uh, it, it layers up even the same gas to where it's a lighter pressure or, or uh, towards the top. And he measured that and showed it in gauges, right? Again, it's all the same gas. We're not even talking about layering anything, but if you took a long, long cylinder, there's gonna be more pressure at the bottom because there is at the top because gravity exists, whatever it is. Okay. Okay, and okay. I, I did a, just a little bit of Google research here. Okay. And now it says liquid oxygen has a density of 1.141 grams per uh, centimeter cubed or uh, 1,141 kilograms per meter cubed. So that's 1141. Uh, ozone has a density of 2.14 kilograms per meter cubed. So now I'm not sure why they're saying liquid oxygen here, but they're saying liquid oxygen is 1,000 and some change kilograms per meter cubed, and dense, uh, ozone is 2.14 kilograms per meter cube okay well and again you're also changing states here liquid oxygen is just that it's a liquid um, yeah i'm not sure i know but there. hexafluoride it has six times more dense than the air and it's uh, up in the atmosphere right now okay and now whether you guys agree with it or not you know i have just demonstrated very clearly that again, without that downward force acceleration phenomenon, whatever the hell you want to call it, relative density becomes moot. Now, you can ask questions like, well, then why does helium go up? Well, that's a good question. You can also ask the question of why is it that, that clouds can retain hundreds, if not thousands of tons of water, and they don't just drop all of a sudden until something happens that causes it to rain. Now, in my particular theory, I believe that that particular phenomenon, and I don't know this for sure, but you know, I'm spitballing, and I also have good evidence to, you know, to push towards that. Okay, but you know, again, obviously, the water in the clouds, and it is not in a gaseous form because it has to be above 212 degrees, right, to be in that gaseous form, right? It has to be much different. Okay, so. Then now we're starting to talk about, okay, so what is holding these things up there? Because they don't, that doesn't conform to the laws of, of relative density, does it? That, that, that's an enigma. Can I get an amen on that? And, and I like, yeah, yeah. I, I like to make my own uh, uh, explanation why I am in like 80% in terms of uh, relative density but we still need some kind of force and we have that forces. And because we are not allowed to test these independent variables uh, individually, we are not going to agree and know for sure what is going on. So can I make my screen yeah, share? Yeah, I agree with that. So. Uh, okay, well, you're right. But, but okay. you, Iri, you just said we couldn't, we couldn't test it when in fact we kind of sort of did, didn't we? Uh, with the vomit comet. That was a no, test. No, because the plane is falling down, yeah, I don't and think you that have that's all the pressure. The you you have the pressure of the atmosphere interacting okay. with that fluids. 
Well, steel. you guys can say that's not the same, but essentially when you accelerate downwards, you're negating that acceleration in the first place. In other words, you're rendering it at zero. That's and and again, right. the thought experiment in space does the exact same thing. Again, the gravimeter does the exact same thing. They all demonstrate the absolute necessity of a downward force. Whether, yeah, you know, they, whether you can say what it is or not, they're demonstrating. All I'm, dem all I'm talking about, guys, is a concept here. And I'm saying, like I said a million times before, there has to be a downward force. Now, whatever it is, I don't know. I'm not claiming to know. Push, but it's, it's not necessary. Okay, I, let me, uh, I, I share my screen a little okay. bit. Okay, uh, let me, whoops, hang on, let me kick over to you. Um, oh, crap, where am I? All right, uh, you are presenting, sir. Okay, perfect. So this is just, I am using a computing software. This is not reality. And this computer software, at, you know, it has the same principle that every uh, equipment, including the grab meter, uh, are uh, created, which is with all these standards of these uh, supposedly, you know, forces and uh, assumptions that we have. So that I want to leave clear that because this is not a flat earther software or nothing like that. It's just a standard software. But what I think in terms of why I am in this not middle position, but uh, that we need to have forces and we have it and we cannot exclude those forces of any of our experiment. Because for me, at least for me, we cannot there is no place to a vacuum or to create a vacuum because the matter will self collapse if there is a really something called vacuum that is my opinion okay it's just, i want to leave that clear but what i did here and this is just for visualizing and, so uh, i am uh, sorry you're wondering on. Ah, if gravity okay, could be hang on, uh, i got to find out where that thing is going to on. its cousin magnetism uh, mm -hmm. and so Sorry, guys. <laughs> My okay. bad. <laughs> no, no, on. I understand. I, I, I messed up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, so this is my, my, you know, way of imagining things and trying to explain others. So we, we are going to see my line of thought. So imagine that these tiny balls are uh, molecules of some kind of medium. You can call it air, you can call it uh, whatever you want, okay? We are not in space, but we have get off all the, you know, pressures or dynamics and even the earth. There is, in this universe, th th there is just these two options. One, there is some kind of fluid medium, okay, like the air, with a density of one, and there is this ball, with the density of one, you know, the same density. And this is the, 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 this uh, ball that has this size gradient is just for the visualization. There are not changing uh, density, there are not changing nothing. It's just this, uh, the, 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 it's just an, 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 an visual representation. So you're gonna see in a moment. So if we have the possibility to do this in real life, maybe we have we can conclude, you know, more precisely what is going on with this all density and gravity and forces. So the software has uh, involved like um, gravity force, which is is just a pointing vector. In this case, down in terms of the software orientation, which you can see here, the software assume that y axis is up. C axis is forward and X axis is sideways. Okay, so that is the creator of this software assume that like maybe the creator of these words assume that too. Okay? okay. So if I if I hit play right now, you're gonna see that this tiny part is doesn't have any properties at all. There is no density in this gap. So the sphere is going to fall down because because the initial gravity force, but the ball and the this be, uh, field representation air it has the same density, so the ball is not going down anymore because 
the equilibrium was, you know, uh, and, and everything in terms of density and forces has this equilibrium. So they are there. Okay. This is mm -hmm. my first uh, setup. So if I reset the simulation and I put the gravity force in zero, nothing's going to happen right. because we don't have any force. Okay? Exactly. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Right. Okay, but this keep is going. a computer software. This All is right. a computer and software, and this is my position, and you can check it along the show. When I'm starting, I'm starting to say, for me, I am 1.5 because for me it's density, is this relative density, but we still have forces without with, with that we need to lead with that forces we cannot take out the forces that we have here so i'm going to introduce this sphere inside this field of air with the same densities we have one density in the sphere we have one density in the uh, column of air or whatever you want to call it we hit play nothing happened and this is a computer software, okay? Now, if I take the sphere and I increase the density, like in 1000, and I hit enter, nothing's gonna happen in this software. And that is, at, at, at least for me, that is what should be happen in this theoretical environment. Okay, and, and your gravity it just- matter. Just to be straight, Eero, your gravity is still set at zero, right? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes, of course. But let, let me just uh, okay. continue. So far, so I agree it, totally it with, the, with the simulation, 100%. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's like the same thing that you you made, uh, you, you pointed out uh, before, okay? If I continue to increase the density, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. So at the moment that I introduce even a tiny force, and I take take this uh, wind for this is just a representation a wind with a vector pointing down. Okay. Let me just reset the camera. Uh, this is the wind. I I, I put a really big um, a big uh, wind speed, and I activate, and I hit play, and I start increasing the density of the object ah, for, uh, for, sorry guys sorry sorry i i <laughs> i need to uh let me just uh because i excluded that okay that's great now uh, i need to increase the force of the wind because it's just and that i don't want to that happen let me sorry for this I did it this in 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 why we are still uh live okay yeah, so no worries. let me so let me hear, and that is going to be really quick, yeah. So, I mean, if I introduce a force, a little force, doesn't matter how much strong it is, it's going to, going not down, because I introduce just a vector orientation. And in fact, this vector is pushing down. It's not something that attracting to the Earth. So, of course, if I increase the density or I decrease the density of this um, spherical, uh, for example, right now is is active, the wind is active, okay? But it's not falling or at least is falling, but really, really, really slow because the density is involved in this uh, computation. And, so and you I have a very, very but, small force from the wind coming from out, a very small force. Exactly. That's why it's going really, really exactly. slow. Perfect sense. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you 100%. But, okay, but if I keep, for example, that tiny, 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 tiny force of the wind, but I increase the density of the spherical object, it's going to fall more quickly because density is a relation between all these uh, conditions. So what I'm trying to, to explain here, and, and I know that I have a little mess, is that we cannot... Uh, set up an environment with uh, independent variables to test everyone independently. For example, in the vomit uh, comet uh, situation, we have still all the atmospheric pressure. And we have all temperature difference, and we have the movement of the plane, 
the, 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 the turbulence of the air around it. I mean, we can make a lot of uh, thought experiments and trying to, you know, maybe predict or extrapolate this even simple exercise, which is like you say before, but we still doesn't have the, you know, the, 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 the properties, no, the properties, sorry, the, the, we don't, we, we can't isolate the ability, condition, yeah. the ability, exactly. So for me, for me, there is, there is a force, not a force, a, a conditions based on electricity and magnetism in this uh, under pressure system uh, or closed system. And all those forces always is going to interact, giving us that kind of orientation. I mean, maybe if we have the, the, the conditions to or the ability to create this uh, a scenario where we have objects with different, different densities, but without any other kind of um, dynamics, maybe happen what you Bob said and what, what I'm showing at the beginning, which we don't have any movement independently of the density of the object, like I doing here, because right. we don't have any, any until force you at all. apply a force. That's the whole point. That's the whole point, Iru. Until you apply a force, until and you that, apply that force, density, the relative density argument is moot. It means nothing without the force. Could be, but we uh, cannot test it. Well, I, I think that, that we can test it. And in fact, the gravimeter yeah. is, is one thing that gives you as a direct test. Um, you know, but, well, we have no idea what it's measuring. He just he's just pointing that out. We have no we, idea. What we it's no, we do know it's what it's measuring. We're, we're, what we're doing is we're we're watching an object. Acceleration is measured the acceleration. Yes, it's measuring, measuring an force. acceleration. And what does what does what, to have an acceleration? What is required in every law of physics? What is required to have an acceleration? Come on, this is an easy one. A force. force. Okay. Yeah. It's as simple Again, as that. Is, yeah, but could it be the energy ley lines or something to do with the magnetic pole or the pressure of the atmosphere it, it, it around it? It doesn't matter what it is. The point yeah, is that there is a... Is. No, it doesn't. The point is that it requires a force. Whether you want to call it wind blowing down like you just demonstrated, or you want to call it uh, using a magnet like I used in my, my thought experiment, or you want to actually use a zero-G plane, or you want to use a vacuum chamber and a gravimeter, the bottom line is there must be a force present, period. Yeah, it, it could be a force attracting higher density objects down, or perhaps... Uh, there is a force uh, up in the ether attracting the lower density gases up. Either way, it would still cause the same tendency. Exactly. That's why I said that in, in the thought experiment in space, you could take that magnet and put it above the ball bearing, you know, because then you still, it doesn't matter where that force is. The fact is that it just simply exists and any force will cause an acceleration. Okay, that is my whole point. Doesn't matter in space whether it's up, down, left, right, whatever. You know, if you apply that same force, that magnetic force to the side of it, then everything's going to accelerate sideways. And guess what? Um, if you had metallic objects in there, they would arrange to the side. That I I, I don't know yeah, how else and, to and, explain this. <laughs> no, and again and again and again, I am in the position that density, mass weight, uh, there are conditions, there are initial conditions, and we cannot isolate that, you know, independent variables to the, to say, okay, no, right now the atmospheric pressure is not acting. Ah, no, right now the electricity is not acting, and we cannot. We live in the world with dynamic forces, and all dynamic forces are contribute to the initial conditions of the object that are inside this world. Agreed. And this this whole thing about uh, up and down is a force that attracting or is a force that pushing or is maybe like a pressure, like, like we understand a pressure, which is in all directions because it's all messed with turbulence, with vorticity, with temperature. So uh, for me, the orientation is how the things was set up for the creator. 
Right. There has to like, be a direction it, that we would call down. There right. has and, to be. And there exactly. is. It's earthward. Okay. Exactly. Good. And I agree with that. Nobody disagrees with that. Whether right. or not there's a force uh, that's sleeping going warrior in that does. direction. <laughs> well, good for, well, for good him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> there, I there, has to, yeah, there has to be a direction that we call down as humans. We would call that direction er, you know, earthward, like you said. Uh, but I think, you know, as far as the vomit comet, I don't think that proves anything. I mean, if you go over a little hump in your car, we can feel our stomach kind of do that, you know, that initial jolt thing that your stomach does when it feels like it goes up into your throat. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that happens to that density tower. It's well, because you, you've, you've caused an acceleration going upwards. In other words, the force was the bump that you went over there that caused an upward acceleration. It doesn't matter what direction you do it in, Jaron. The bottom line is a force is required no matter what. That's my whole point. Without that force, the relative density argument is absolutely moot. Iru just proved it again in his computer simulation. You, there must be a force there. There has I'm to not be. Proven. No. I illustrate. I'm illustrate. Well, you illustrate. No, you didn't, okay. you didn't what I yeah. think. What I think. Yeah, right. I'm not proving right. anything. Now, right. because if not, I, I'm gonna end it. You know, I'm gonna end it like you, Bob, with your uh, um, where your Nobel Prize. If you say that, okay. <laughs> so don't don't put words in my mouth, please. Okay? It's like he, I'm sure he can create orbits around spherical bodies too. It doesn't prove that yeah. those orbits oh. happen in real in Earth. In fact, I can do that. <laughs> so let's uh, mirror when you're done. Uh, when yeah, you are, let me are... just. Uh, I I want to just one more thing, which is, uh, you know, for me, it's really. And this is, is not proof of anything and maybe it's not related, but for me also that we must be trying to, you know, analyze is how the electricity behaves in this condition. Because when supposedly, when supposedly you take off the air in the vacuum chamber, you have plasma, but because you still have particles inside that toy vacuum chamber. And, and and I'm trying to find the video that uh, we are up in the in the uh, in the sky, and uh, I believe it's this one. And uh, for me, that also this called my attention. This kind of limit where the electricity tends to go to the earth, but some other trying to go up, for example, and stop. Mm. And for me, is that the exa exafluoruro uh, gas that compose the atmosphere and things like that so yeah i just uh, think it's know, hitting the firmament <laughs> yeah but, but that, with that's these me gases, right? you have that conditions uh, because the uh, hexa hexafluoride is uh it doesn't allow electricity conductivity so mm -hmm. and we we know that that gas is up there and is really prominent and one of the most uh abundant in our atmosphere and has a duration with uh, like 3,200 years, any time that, for example, a volcano make an eruption. So we have that gas for eternity. And But this is, for me, our initial conditions of this world. It's how it was set up. It's like saying, what, like we expressed at the beginning, what we have dirt, well, we have water, what we have whatever, uh, is because it was created in that way. Yep. Very good. But I, I, <clears throat> I, I to, to, to close my, uh, my case, for me, it's a relationship between density or relative density and dynamic forces. I totally okay. agree. I, think, I, I don't think we've proven that things have any force pulling to the earth because, as you said earlier, for all you know, it could be something pushing from above or, as John said, pulling lighter things up towards the sky. So there is no proof of any of those. They're the initial conditions. They're what... Uh, is it just no, is no? There's proof of force. Whether it's up, down, left, or right, there is proof of force. You you, you cannot get away from that, Jaron. There is proof of force. I'm, I'm sharing. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there is proof of force. So I just haven't seen it yet. Oh my god. Okay. All right. Well, can you, can, you can't you can't just accept that, that that I haven't been shown enough proof to say that there's a force. Sure, the I, can that that. That. Okay, I can accept that. I can accept that. But and we're good. But, then, then we're good. Okay, so now let's move to the next area of where, let me share my screen here, of obviously the one thing that, that we seem to have agreed on um, 
and and first of all, are, are we even back? Are we back to the point where um, now you're going to say that um, the relative density experiment? Uh, are, are you disagreeing then that that some sort of force has to be present, whatever the hell it is, um, in order for the relative density argument to uh, work? Are you agreeing or disagreeing with that? That relative density itself can be a force. I'm no, not disagreeing with that. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, oh. do you think that in order for relative density to work, there must be some sort of force present? No, I think a change in disequilibrium can create forces. <sighs> okay. All right. Well, I'm not going to argue any further with you. So let's move on into the point where um, I think that it may have something to do with an electrostatic or electro. Uh, magnetic type of argument, okay? And you guys can see my screen, yes? Uh, I don't know. I can't. Uh, I just see blackness. Oh, maybe I'm. Maybe I didn't. Show. Yeah, yeah, I in a white now. shirt with a red tie. Yep. Yeah, I see it now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you guys have all heard and seen my presentation on uh, NASA's satellite tethers, um, the tether incidents. They're them describing that what they do is they put a charge potential on that tether which causes the satellite or balloon to go up and down, etc. You have all seen my presentation about the University of Bristol spider ballooning, um, where the spiders cast a, a spin of silk, and then they charge it with so many KEV, okay? And then, mm -hmm. as a result of that, the spider is able to go up and down also. So those are a couple of, of, of my submissions, let's just say, that that are the reason that I believe that gravity has some sort of electrostatic or electromagnetic component. Now, what I want to show you, and I'm sure you've all seen this before, is this guy who is, his name is Boyd Bushman, and he's a senior scientist at Lockheed Martin. He's talking about the Hutchinson effect, but he's right in this example, he's talking about an experiment that he did where he took essentially two rocks or two identical things but inside of one of the rocks, he put a couple of uh, high-powered neodymium magnets. And then he then took uh, them to the top of some building or something, and he dropped it off the side of one of the Lockheed buildings, and he had a bunch of people down there. And he said, okay, whichever one uh, comes to the ground first, um, I want to see that. And so... What happens is, is the objects do not fall at the same speed. Uh, there is quite a difference in between the two. And the only difference is that one has a set of neodymium magnets in it, which would imply, okay, not prove anything, but it would imply that something with the magnetic effect is interfering or interacting with this downward acceleration force. So, okay? so isn't that what the gravimeter can be measuring? If there's different magnets below my feet, if the ground is constructed of different things, wouldn't that change what the gravimeter says? You just, you just the gravimeter that. is 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 detecting nothing other than acceleration. So if you put magnets underneath it, it wouldn't affect it at all. If you put if you put a neodymium neodymium magnet below it or around it, it's not going to affect it at all. If you put it in a Faraday oh, cage, it's not it, going to affect it at all. It likely would. Yes. Okay. Well, then just say. That I, I don't know about proving. the Faraday cage, but 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 the magnets, obviously, especially. Well, it depends. If now this this part I don't know. It depends on whether or not the object that is dropped is magnetic, um, or non-magnetic, or even paramagnetic, or you know, diamagnetic, whatever. I don't know what the material is. I didn't research right. that that much. But what the bottom line is, is what it's doing is it's measuring accelerations and differences in accelerations from point to point, proving A, that there is an acceleration and B, that it is variable for whatever reason. Now, okay. this guy, Boyd uh, Bushman, um, I'm going to let him talk about, man, I hate losing my voice here. I'm going to let him talk about what he did with his experiment. And then um, I, I would like you guys in your paradigm of simple relative density to explain this result if you can. Um, and I'm not expecting you to be able to, but I'm just saying that in the paradigm of relative density, it is inexplicable, but let's give him a hear. Let's listen to him. So I, uh, I found that when I take two magnets together, I have 
some neodymiums around here that I'm actually afraid of. They, they're they so can, strong. They can, they can danger you. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, you take a magnet, you go to put them together and go, and they go clunk, right? Mm -hmm. But you take one of them, move it around, and all of a sudden it doesn't want to yeah, go right. together. Yeah, right. The repulsive. So I got, uh, I had, I ordered one at five thousand dollars a piece, wow. with 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 a quarter inch hole through between both of them, and I put a brass bolt and I tighten them down, forcing them together. Mm -hmm. And then I put them together in a thing that looks kind of like a rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I got another one that didn't have magnets in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Galileo, in, in all his endeavors, he went up to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And dropped the... And he dropped a big rock and a small rock. Mm -hmm. And his buddy down at the bottom kept telling him that the large rock, rock and the small rock arrived at the same time. Not even true. Yeah, that's right like a complete hand. total hoax. Yeah, not I know. True, it's never happened. Okay. I, I know, but just keep listening. <laughs> I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery. And, and by the way, this is horse shit too, too but I'm field. just, it's part of the video. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? This proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Okay. Well, I went up to in, in the Lockheed Building 501 mm -hmm. by the side of escalators and, and elevators. Oh, wow. And I got, I got, uh, I got, I got uh, nine guys that were not educated and didn't have pre <laughs> didn't have uh, pre opinions on anything, mm. and I dropped my two rocks, mm -hmm. and, and I said, "What I would like you to do is," I told them, "What I'd like you to do is I would like you to take whichever one arrives first, get it in your hand, and when I come down the elevator, hand it to me." Mm -hmm. Now they looked identical, except for. So, and it nobody knew what was inside not, of it? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. All the nine times that I tested it, it's as though the one with the opposing magnet field extending out mm -hmm. three feet on each side, I actually measured how, how far, big the field is. How big the field was. And on each side of, a rock, that, of one rock, I had a total of six feet. At any rate, the other, the other rock arrived first. Which one arrived first? The, the one... The one that had no magnetic field in it. So you were able to cancel out gravity to a certain degree. You were able like to that? cancel, Precisely. reduce the mass gravity effect. Precisely. By, okay. by opposing fields. Isn't that nice? You, you bet. And got nine signatures and what I always skip. You, know, you I, did that at Lockheed. I, all right. Okay, so what he's saying then is the rock that had the magnets with the opposing fields came down at a slower rate then the other rock and, you know, theoretically, like they said, supposedly all objects drop at the same speed. Now, this is an indicator that all objects do not necessarily drop at the same speed. And in, in this effect, in this particular case, it was because of the magnetic fields, okay, that are on it. Now, I'm going to show you another example. And this comes to us, uh, this came to my attention the very first time from UAP, uh, which you guys uh, know who he is, and I'm going to play this really quick. This program. To him. I'm, I'm sorry, say again? No, no, okay. we know him, and we say hello to Oh, UAP okay, yeah, hello UAP. UAP. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I probably should have queued this at the right spot. Let me find it really quick. And we'll uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. And it is in free fall. In space. Conduct microgravity. But how do you replicate microgravity okay, here, we go. here on Earth? NASA here on Earth. We need to create that down here on the Earth. And we can do that here in a 2.2 second drop down. Forks of seven and a half inches. The experiment experiences weightlessness, similar to what would be expected in space. Conduct microgravity experiments here on Earth when we can easily conduct them in space. A drop tower is where you can achieve free fall 
uh, status in a vacuum by launching something up and it is in free fall all the way up and then all the way back down and you can do experiments on gravity. Now here they did experiments on elements at the SARM drop tower in uh, uh, Bremen or similar to Bremen. Um, you can see the elements uh, fall at different rates which just destroys the uh, simple gravitational law equation theory hypothesis well failed hypothesis you see that they behave differently in the drop test Okay, so um, what UAP is showing here, and, and granted this is a very short clip, and I've got the clip I'll put in the show notes, but essentially what it's showing is it's showing these different elements, you know, lithium, you know, et cetera, going across. And what's happening is in this vacuum chamber, it, he's showing that they are indeed falling at different rates. Well, what does that imply? To me, that implies that because of the fact that these, these elements have different uh, electrical makeup or atomic structure um, that that NCT. yeah <laughs> no they're all exactly the same density and they're all exactly the same weight um so yeah but they're all made up of different magnetic they could be different items they could be opposing magnetic forces they could one could be electrically conductive or charged items different properties that are included will obviously change the speed at which things fall yes and precisely that's the, the whole speed. point that's the whole point that's why i'm saying Great. that that the yeah. the the well, like demonstration that. with the feather and the bowling ball is horseshit because what he has demonstrated here is that different materials will indeed in a vacuum fall at different different rates which debunks the mainstream idea that that gravity supposedly pulls on all things equally when in fact totally agree. it does not. My point here is that I'm trying to say that I believe that whatever gravity is, this this downward force, um, it, it, it certainly isn't mass attracting mass and it certainly isn't bendy space. I think that it is either an electro uh, uh, electrical property or magnetic property or a kind of a mixture in the two called a dielectric property, okay? Now, so, all I'm saying is that I'm offering this in support of my case that I believe that gravity is either electrostatic or electromagnetic in nature or a mixture of both. Um, and this combined with the spider ballooning and the tethering all, to me, give evidence that you know gravity, whatever it is, is, is actually a force that we are very familiar with, and it all stems from electricity. Of course, electricity and magnetism are essentially one and the same. They're, they're the same head of the hydra. And if you listen to Ken Wheeler, um, in his you know talks, he says that they're all the same thing. Gravity, electromagnetism, uh, electrostatics <clears throat> are all exactly the same thing. They're all different heads of the same hydra. So that is why I'm saying that, no, I don't agree with with the baller's model of gravity. My whole case here is that this acceleration that Eero showed in his demonstration, that I showed in my demonstration, that I showed in the thought experiment, what the hell ever it is, okay, is still, is still required in order to make this relative density argument work. And now what that is, I don't know, uh, but I'm trying to build a case here to say that it's something electrical or magnetic. Okay, that's all I'm saying. I don't purport to know what the hell it is. All I know is that we know how it behaves and we've known this for a long time. We also know that that force is absolutely there um, and it has been demonstrated by, you know, maybe not to Jaren's satisfaction, but I think a lot of people will see, you know, the point that I'm getting at. And again, that point is, is that without some sort of acceleration or force, the density, the relative density argument is rendered moot. And that's all I have to say about it, you know? And, and, and guys, take, take an example from this. You know, Jaron disagrees with me, and that's fine, because now he's heard me out. 
he still he still doesn't have enough to quite come over and that's fine but the idea was here to present my side of this and to tell you guys that i believe very strongly there must be a force and if you want to call that force gravity whatever okay but it's a force it's it's an acceleration if it's an acceleration then it requires a force whatever um it's there whatever it is and that's all i'm saying okay and i don't mind that jaron doesn't see it it's cool because now i know at least he's heard me on it okay and i still love him and we're still friends and i'm not going to call him a shill or an agent anthony riley um because he has a different opinion than i do simple as that okay so morgo so, oh go ahead no i was just gonna say so when <clears throat> and i don't know the answer to this that's why i'm asking so when hot goes to cold or we know that um you know high pressure goes oh somebody's driving too fast speeding uh, when, <laughs> when when something goes from high pressure to low pressure is there an acceleration involved there when something goes from high pressure to low pressure or when something goes from hot to cold which are just known known things in the universe they're just things that happen that we know they're just laws they just have to be right, right. but there's no okay but is there an acceleration involved in one going from one to the other well you mean well, like yes. like like from from hot to cold like the the second law of thermodynamics or you know vacuums sure. from is there an acceleration well is there, yeah. is there a force? Is there a force involved there? Yeah, yes, there is. Okay, that was my question. I didn't know. So that, that's calculable? They calculate the force? Oh, probably. I, I don't know how to calculate it, but probably. Uh, go ahead, Earl. Right. No, no, I mean, there is vorticity. And vorticity, you can define or you can calculate uh, the different movement inside a vortice uh, field and you can call that movement change in speed and you can call that change speed acceleration or deceleration or whatever right but there's no attracting force causing it just like there can be those changes in in like you just said there can be changes in velocity mm -hmm. there can be exactly. changes right okay because it's all set up from the beginning so well it's in, just in the case in, in the case from hot to cold it's more of a convective type of phenomenon um and again this doesn't right. necessarily just, relate to gravity it might but i i don't think so well i think we may just be you know misunderstanding the terms or the way that they've set it up for us to understand oh it. I mean, god like, yes saying... Jaren. i absolutely 100 percent agree with that that the, this whole terminology thing is right. is absolutely designed to obfuscate i 100 percent agree with you there that's why we're having this stupid argument yeah, no. <laughs> it's largely and, and because of terminology right. And I think that's what Yeru was saying from the beginning and what I totally agree with, that, uh, that some things just are the way they are. And so to say um, that there's necessarily a force pulling us down towards the earth, I mean, that would be like then I could think somebody could argue then to me that there's a force uh, pulling gas pressure into the vacuum, that there's a force pulling hot into cold. And I'm not sure we need to describe that as a force. It, it's it's necessarily a, a way things go. It's the way things are. It was It's been set up that way. Otherwise... Things couldn't exist. They have right. to have some sort of way to go. It's a law. So I mean, relative, right? And relative density to me doesn't explain magnetism. And it's not meant to. Magnetism is a known, provable, testable, repeatable force of attraction or re repulsion. Um, but when we're talking about items traveling through an extremely charged medium, which all items do, because the entire world is electromagnetic in nature. So, yeah, you know, I totally agree with you when you say you know things falling at different speeds. Uh, I definitely think that's true. I think the whole lie is the fact that they want people to believe this 9.8 meters per second squared. Everything falls at the same speed. They had anytime they lie to you about a story, have huge red flags go off. So when we were told that Galileo took balls up and he dropped them, and then you find out that that never happened and it's completely false, you have to ask yourself, why are they telling me that story? And, and that's where I think lies a lot of this problem is that they want us to believe these ideas of 9.8 meters per second squared and that there's a force pulling things down and that to things fall at the same speed when it's just not true. It's just not true unless you create, if you want to create a vacuum, and I don't even believe that the video that we see of the two things falling, what is it, the feather and the bowling ball, uh, I believe that's got all kinds of edits in it and everything. Oh, I but, agree. Uh, <laughs> totally. And I, and I, and I, it, I can agree with, with Bob on the fact that uh, there could be something. Uh, now he, I agree with him on the fact that it's certainly not mass attracting mass. You know, is there some preferential um, 
direction caused by the forces that are here on Earth? Sure, there could be. So, I mean, I think that's what Iru was saying, too, is that we can never remove enough variables to say for sure that that is true because we live here on Earth. And so we can we can postulate, we can spitball, we can uh, have disagreements, but I think ultimately it comes down to a lot of semantics, a lot of uh, forces and definitions of, of uh, these different words that they want us to kind of trip over, and I don't think any of it explains uh, anything. I mean, I, I've been asking people this question, and I still haven't gotten a good answer, but I'll go ahead and do a, a theoretical thing like, like Bob did, you know, a little thought experiment. But they tell us that things in a vacuum move at 9.8 meters per second squared if forever, I guess. I don't know when we can't, like Ira said, we can't build a chamber long enough to actually test that. But true. That's simply say, what the math says. That's that's all the math is saying. You know, right. whether or not it's so, true, who knows? <laughs> correct. So let's say that let's say that Mars, just for we're gonna use this for thought experiment, let's say that Mars is the size of Earth and has the exact same gravity as Earth. Okay. So if if you launch something towards Mars from the Earth, it should continue accelerating on its way there. But that's not even what they say it happens. They say, oh, well, in space, if you launch something at 55,000 miles per hour, it just stays at 55,000 miles per hour. It just that's it just floats in space. There's nothing else acting on it. So I get very confused when that. I'm like, well, then why? When And of course, the reason why is because if we build a gravity chamber, I'm sorry, a vacuum chamber, we have to build it on Earth. And so it, it, everything exists here. And so when something's falling towards the Earth, how can we take that out of that context? And I think that's really what Yuru was trying to say is that we can't. We can't remove some of these elements. We can't remove electromagnetism from the atmosphere to to test and say which is which which is causing it is there something pulling down from below is there something pushing from above and so when i say relative density explains it and i don't need a force um you know i, I guess I'll, i just still think that that's okay i mean i don't think i need to say that there's a force and i guess my main reason for saying that is again how i know that uh globers are desperate to need things to pull into spheres. I don't think pull things pull into spheres. I don't think that things need to pull to the center. And so with that, it's very easy for me to say that, that relative density kind of explains everything. And this way, I don't need to say that there's some force pulling things down to the earth because I can't find it and I can't see it. And yeah, we can do forces on top of the earth. We can put some sort of uh, electricity and, and draw particles up. We can draw things to the side, like the TV screen we talk about with the dust particles. Well, we can do all that and prove what it is that we wiggled that caused that to happen. But we can't do that with the Earth, at least that I've ever seen. I, I don't see things, uh, a way to test that. And I, the Vomit Comet is probably you know, one of the interesting things that was shown, but I don't see that as well. Um, I just filled up real quick. I ran and filled up a bottle of water and put some oil in it. And to me, if I shake that up, of course it's in disequilibrium. And then I was kind of swinging it around in a circle. And of course those things will not separate because they're in motion. So the same thing happens on the Vomit Comet. Those things are are in great motion. It maybe give, gives us the illusion of what Bob talked about when he said, oh, we can have this marble or this ball bearing and this magnet and what would happen. Well, we can never test that. It's not even something that exists. There's Not even ballers believe in that. They don't believe that you can go to space and just float around. You're always in orbit of something. So it's the same kind of thing. Is That just seems like to me to go to the vomit comet and say, oh, this plane is falling. But when we look at it with a camera inside of it, it gives us the illusion that things are floating around. They're not. They're in vast disarray. They're being forced down at an incredible speed. That plane is probably falling at, I don't know, something like, uh, well, how the, fast it, do you think that thing's falling? How many feet per second? Seven, 750 uh, mile an hour or, or something. Like about 9.8 meters per second squared. <laughs> not the atmosphere, it's not. <laughs> Well, somewhere around there, but but the acceleration has got to be close to what the so-called gravitational pull is. And and by the way, uh, Jaron, I mean I, I understand completely what you're saying. And the, the, obviously, the place that we disagree is is I believe that it it can be demonstrated and was demonstrated. Um, and you know that's simply my position. I, it, you know, the evidence to me is very clear. All you're doing by diving that plane and using a force to do it, by the way because you're forcing that plane down, you know, by hitting the down elevator, you are essentially counteracting the already existing downward force and neutralizing it. That's what's don't happening. They, That's why everything's floating. The, don't they just cut the engines? They cut the engine and they nose it down. It, it has to be, it has to go down at a rate commensurate that, that would, that would uh, equalize the, 
gravitational force, the downward force that's natural, right? So you're doing a down to equalize a down force. Uh, so you're using a force to negate a force. But the fact is, the force is there to negate the force. They're both there. You're just negating one with the other. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, it's more like a, like a pressure, something that is pushing uh, from above to bottom, than something that is attracting from the bottom, you know, uh, in that kind of orientation. Sorry, guys. But for me, uh, it's the density is a condition, but we cannot uh, test it in no dynamics place, you know, to see what happened. Technically, technically, you can say, okay, if I am in a special place where I have an object with some density, put in, in some kind of medium with other density, less density in this case, assume this one density, you can call air, you can call whatever you want, and I have a ball with 50 densities, and we don't have any dynamic force. What happened? Maybe both objects still just where God put it, or who was the creator put it, and maybe it fall from the, or, or, or go, go somewhere uh, via or base in the, its weight or its density, but we cannot test it that. We are under a dynamic place with a lot of forces involved all the time and you cannot isolate and leave just one. Okay, well, <laughs> there you have it. And uh, Cammy just sent me this, it's a frog, frog floating, but again, we're negating, you know, we're negating the forces that would normally make him, you know, sit on the bottom of this apparatus, whatever it is. So the thing I find interesting about this is this, this argument in and of itself is almost as polarizing as flat earth itself. That's that I find this amazing um, that, you know, there's such a wide difference of opinion on what's actually going on here. And that's fine because you know what, that's exactly what I wanted to stimulate and not only Jaron and Nero and John, but, but the audience as well. And if you still don't believe that this force exists, that's great, you know, whatever, but it, it's out there now. And now I expect to see a huge healthy debate on this and I can almost <laughs> guarantee you it's going to happen. Right. <laughs> yeah. The people's going to say, Bob, uh, this proof the, uh, I know, I, oh, you I know that the, the Globers right, right now are loving me. Okay. The Globers right now are loving me just like they, they, they they love me uh, for proving the rotation you're, of you're, the earth. Yeah. yeah you're, pr you're so proving, fine. you're, you're proving, uh, gravity now you've already proved yeah. spin. So know. next I believe is Bob's going to prove curve. That's right. I'm, I'm ball yeah. Well, no, next, next <laughs> week I'm going to prove, um, that you can have a pressurized system next to a vacuum. <laughs> and, just, you know, I would just, just say that kidding. It's not, proving, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not proving gravity. It's just proving, in, in my opinion, that you must have a tendency or a bias for higher density objects to fall and lower density objects to rise. And That's I agree it. with that. Yeah, and I agree with that statement. So, um, Bob, ask the question again. I want to see if anybody switched over. You know, well, I guess there was no way to tell that, but maybe everyone swayed over <laughs> to two. Maybe the Vomit Comet did it. Um, for me, I don't, you know, the vomit comet is, is, it's not really in free fall. It's kind of the illusion. They, like they say, they gives you the illusion of weightlessness. Right. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily, um, Let's... a testing ground for the gravity tower, but uh, go ahead and ask everybody again. Okay. So, it, it, and one thing I want to say about that, instead of 9.8 meters per second squared, since, since the air inside of the airplane is roughly, you know, it's pressurized at something like nine or 10,000 feet. And the airplane is coming down. Let's just assume that the downward velocity of the airplane is 120 miles an hour, right? Terminal velocity. Okay, so we can we can assume that because we know that that's roughly terminal velocity. If you're a skydiver and you jump out of a plane, that's pretty much where you're going to get to, etc. So okay, so you guys have all heard this, and so it comes down to this: um, Do you believe that? That, that I have made the case essentially and, and that that gravity or whatever it is. And like I said, I'm just using the word gravity. You can call it whatever. 
Um, but we're, we're talking about, let's just use the word gravity for now. I, I don't like using it any more than anybody else does. But let's just say that, uh, number one, you agree, again, with Jaron, and that relative density is all that is required. Or number two, you agree with me, and you believe that there must be some sort of an acceleration or force to validate and make you know, viable the relative density argument. So one for Jaron, two for me. Hey, Jaron, that's not fair. You're voting for yourself. I saw that. <laughs> I also give all my videos thumbs up. <laughs> <It's the same laughs> thing. Me too, man. Yeah, you think I? Yeah, come on, I get so many dislikes, and yeah, I have to, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take mean, all my own, my own praise that I can. <laughs> exactly. No, actually, it seems like much. Uh, looks like much. Hey, Bob, you voted for yourself too. Well, that's because you did. <laughs> neener, oh, neener. Making sure, <laughs> and I, I was making sure that wasn't 5, before. 5, I did. 1.5, 1. 1. 1.5. Okay, yours got 1.5. Yeah. Uh, it All looks right. like more people are on the two side than uh, some yes. people at two and a half. So, so I made I made a little I made a little dent. Okay, that that, that makes yeah. me happy. But you know what, guys? No matter which way you voted. All I'm asking, and, and really, seriously, think about this. Think about it hard. Play this lecture over again. Go over the points. Try and prove it yourself. And, and have a discussion over this. Because, now you guys know, I am a flat earther. I am a hardcore flat earther. But I'm also a person that, you know, likes to, to bring Globusters in the direction of science. And this is something that, that I have tried to do since day one. And like I said, it's fine if you disagree with me. It's fine if Jaron and Nero disagree with me, even though they kind of agree with me. It's okay. But the idea here is to get the dialogue going and maybe think a little bit more next time before you say gravity is some sort of made up farce that means absolutely nothing. Because I think that, that if I have done nothing else today, I have given you a lot to think about. Okay. So, that's that's where I'm at on. And John, we haven't heard a whole lot from you, buddy. <laughs> Why don't you give us your rundown? <laughs> well, I, I would just say that I have to agree, uh, Bob, that the vomit comet test shows that you must have the tendency that we described for lower density objects to fall and higher density objects to rise. Um, density and buoyancy definitely does explain um, what goes up must come down on flat Earth. Although you still must have that tendency or that bias for higher density objects to fall. Otherwise, you would have total chaos, total anarchy. There would be no uh, directional preference for higher density objects. And so I, I would just, just say that I have to agree that uh, density and buoyancy uh, will only work if you have such a uh, tendency or a bias that is often called gravity. So there okay. you have it. So that would be a two then. A two for sure. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, there you have it. And we're all still friends, guys. We're all still friends. Nobody's calling anybody a shill. Nobody's calling anybody an agent, um, even though Jern and Nero are agents. No, just kidding. <laughs> I am not. I'm a shill. <laughs> that's, oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I am just a Latin American. And Nero's uh, upside down. That's all. Yeah. That's right. And Nero's upside down. <laughs> <clears throat> Good thing gravity's there, Nero, right? <laughs> yes all right cool all right so you know what wow wow it's 420 already so uh, i actually had a whole lot of other really neat stuff um but i think i'm just going to hold it off for next week because we are well past our three hours so uh yeah i hope everybody I enjoyed it's good presentation. it will stir yeah it'll stir some some good conversation and i think this is good for flat earth i really do I think that if we all just agreed, then it's very easy for people to say, oh, it's just an echo chamber. These guys all agree. They just agree with each other, pat each other on the back. Clearly not what happened today, and I think it will spur some uh, some good conversations about it. And w with that, we can only get closer to the truth, hear some other people's arguments. Maybe people will find some videos that we didn't know about or some explanations that will help. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And I think Bob did a good job uh, showing his case. That, you know, the Vomit Comets one that uh, – uh, I th you know, the more I'm playing with, I, I have this bottle filled with oil and water right now, and I'm just playing with it constantly. It's got a little strap on the top. I take it with me when I go for walks or bike rides or whatever. And if I shake it up and I start swinging it in circles, it will not uh, recoalesce. But if I leave it as it is and start swinging it in circles, it does stay separated. So there's a lot of stuff in there that I need to think about. So, Bob, appreciate the, uh, the presentation. All right. No problem. And uh, remember, guys, one other thing.
Don't do it. This don't is do it. Please, 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 please. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help oh, it. <laughs> I think he got that shirt from Fight the Flat Earth. Probably. Yep. All right, cool. So we'll go around one last time for any other comments, and then we'll call it a show. Um, Eero, what do you got coming up, buddy? Anything special? Yeah, I'm going to try to find my own orientation because right now I, I am diagonal, man. I am diagonal. Yeah, yeah. You, here in Argentina, we are about, I don't know what latitude, but we are diagonal, you know, and this is really hard to do. And no, uh, talking seriously, I am, um, well, I finished one of the, uh, one of um, some of my best pe patron uh, uh, tell me that uh, do it, which is a <laughs> <laughs> perspective simulation. You know, Sheran right now is my owner because he, he gave me $20, $20 in Patreon. So he had me all the time working for him. <laughs> and uh, I cannot do any more else. You know, I am all the time doing that. And no, no, yeah, man. No, I finished. I finished the the uh, the computer simulation. Uh, so I'm gonna try to send you m tonight or maybe tomorrow. Please, please. I sent you my email, uh, so you got it. Yes, yeah, I know that. But no, here in Argentina, well, we are we are having in Latin America, in South America, exactly. We having a, a quite a lot of uh, flutter conference. We have one in uh, 30 uh, in one month in chile and in 45 days another one in chile and right now i'm going to go to barcelona in about 20 days and give a presentation there like the uh at, like uh, the, the same one at the beginning of the year but i'm going to i'm going to talk about the electric universe my point of view and my own research about that and I keep doing, um, you know, video for my for my uh, YouTube channel, and I'm trying to do a little more in English, but uh, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna try to do it. But it it's really hard to me because I have a, a little more of a regular work here in Argentina, so you know, the same stuff as always, trying to conquer the world. All right, beautiful. Okay. So yeah, I'll be looking forward to seeing all that stuff. You got the conference and I saw your video on it and that that's just super very active in the uh, uh, Spanish speaking community. And, you know, like I said, Ira, we are very proud to have you with us on Globusters. You do a great job and uh, you're an awesome asset, sir. So, Thank you. Uh, all right. So next up, John, the Morgal, uh, what do you got coming out uh, or any last words that you want to say? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm finishing up. It's taken a little bit longer than I had uh, expected, but I'm finishing up section two of the uh, short and sweet uh, flat earth proof videos. Um, this one is going to cover um, what the hell is it? Oh, problems with eclipses. And I've got another one that I've also sort of started, which I probably shouldn't have done, that uh, describes an ex well. I hate to use the word experiment, but I'll go ahead and use the word experiment that I did recently that involves uh, running and jumping towards the rear and the front of a moving train. So um, be on the lookout for those and a new chapter of uh, the Creature from Jekyll Island uh, coming out shortly. Ho I'm going to try to get all this stuff done this weekend, but uh, weekend's almost over. So maybe by the end next week, who knows? But yeah, okay. lots of stuff cooking. Beautiful. And as far as that that uh, train experiment, uh, John, I have a I have a uh, a show a fan of the show that um, is really quite well educated that uh, has offered me some evidence on that that you may be interested in. So I will uh, try and pass that along to you. But uh, needless to say, I would say he definitely agrees with you. So. Um. Awesome. And then also, um, my, my wife was in a car accident last week. So if you guys could just uh, send out prayers her way, that would be much appreciated. All right. Well, we'll so do that, that. For, for Mina. Okay. All right. And last but certainly not least, um, we have our very own Schillerism. <laughs> not Jaren. Sh <laughs> Schillerism. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> so Thank what do you got coming sure. up this week? Uh, we still need to do the Electric Universe show, but uh, other than that, what, what else you got coming up? 
So I was supposed to have uh, Ranty on the show the other day. I know we're going to be doing that on Wednesday, so check that out on my channel uh, Wednesday. I believe it's going to be 2 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. So no, I'm sorry about that. That's wrong. That's 2 p.m. my time, which will be 9 p.m. GMT. Sorry, I screwed oh, that up. And, and speaking of that, Jaron, I heard that uh, the reason Ranty was not on your show is because he was out proving gravity. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, he learned it in a hard way. <laughs> he, yeah, he fell off. A, he fell off a ladder and landed on a knife, and uh, he's clearly more more dense than the air around him, and hence he fell and hit the knife. But <laughs> uh, no, just keep an eye on my channel for for live streams and everything. I might be looking into possibly going down to the Salton Sea on June second, uh, having to talk to the guys that are involved in that and really make sure that we've got it. Uh, scheduled in a way that I think will work out. I've got some graduation parties. Obviously, uh, congratulations to everyone who's uh, graduating, <laughs> including my sister who uh, graduated with masters in art. Uh, so we've got a lot of parties coming up to go to the first and the eighth. I'll be at parties. So maybe the second, I might go down to the Salton Sea to do a, a mirror observation from across the uh, water. There, I talked about it a little bit in my last live stream. So uh, all kinds of stuff coming up. Just keep an eye on my channel. And then also, I just want to ask people if you could. Uh, subscribe to Jaronism Raw. It is uh, my second channel where I'll be posting uh, some clips and some other stuff. I might go live there on occasion. Just posted my Gary Corsair interview there and Monday Night Raw from last week. Uh, Monday Raw Live will still be on TFR, but uh, if David and I can keep our P's and Q's straight and not mention the the absolute no-no words for YouTube too often, then uh, we'll put that over on the Jaronism uh, Raw channel, and that's just Jaronism Raw. Go over there, subscribe, and uh, that'd be awesome. So thanks, everyone. Appreciate you listening, as always. All I right. subscribed mm-hmm. yesterday. My life changed it. <clears throat> Thank- oh, <laughs> man. So much, yeah. so much good yeah, things. I follow your, you. yeah. I've always yeah, been subscribed. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Bob. Yeah. You're, what's wrong with you? Why would it take so long? That's right. <laughs> okay, guys. So, um, All right. So guys, I want to tell you that that again, this whole the whole reason for this um, was so that we could literally get some conversation going on it. Um, I'm you know in the comments as always. You know I don't tolerate BS comments. Um, if you disagree with me, that's fine. Um, keep it civil and preferably give a reason why you disagree with me. If you disagree with Jaron or Iru or John or anybody else, um, that's fine too. Keep it civil and preferably give a reason why. In other words, you know, let's make a discussion out of this and let's keep it nice. Let's keep it amiable. Do not call people agents or ignorant um, because I will delete those comments sight unseen. And and as you know, all comments are held for review on this channel because I don't put up with the troll BS. I just don't. But I really do want to see a discussion come out of this because this is a very, very uh, contentious issue in the flat earth. And uh, I would like to see it get resolved out uh, among other people. So um, that's all I'm saying. Just keep it nice. Keep it civil. Um, let's get a good discussion going on it. So. And before before we go, I do want to see in the uh, chat uh, <clears throat> Team Alba or Team Beal, just for the fun of it. <laughs> I'm definitely Team Alba. Anyway, yeah. that's it. Yeah, I, I wish I, I, you know, I'll have to look at the pictures of the two girls and see which one I like better and I'll send it to you. But I have no idea. Like I said, when you say Jessica Beal, I think of the girl that's in Flashdance. And I don't even know if that's the right person, but anyway, Flashdance. <laughs> yeah, remember that movie right. from Not a million a... years ago? No, no, I don't. Uh, Flashdance. Oh, at... that's from like the early '80s or mid. Was it the late '70s, early '80s? One. It was oh, awful. No. Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> uh, her name is Je- oh, her name is Jennifer Beals. Oh, Jennifer Beals. Okay, my bad. All right, all right. So I have no I'm idea talking... who Jessica Beale is then. <laughs> yeah, Jessica and then B-E-I-L. I don't know. She was probably born after that movie. She was born 1982. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know when the movie <laughs> All right. <laughs> so so I'm an old fart. Movie. What can I say? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, All right. So anyway. Cool. That's no, funny. All right. Talk to you guys later. All right, guys. Well, um, we'll call that a show then. We'll see you next week. And uh, I will continue on with a lot of the really cool stuff that, that even Eero posted in the, the chat last night. I thought was fabulous. And we will cover that next week if you don't wind up covering it beforehand. Um, but, uh, that's about it. Um, uh, so we'll call it a show and uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. Until then, be good to each other. Don't lie to each other. Open your mind because there's truth inside. Peace out, everybody. Peace. Peace. Peace out.